What's up my fellow ambitious poker players and welcome to the Mechanics of Poker podcast in which me, Rene, aka The Wacko and Adam Carmichael deconstruct high stakes poker players, figuring out what it is about them, how they think, what they do that makes them so successful with an extra focus on the obstacles they faced and the skills they had to develop to surpass them. This podcast is brought to you by Poker Ambition. If you are ambitious about making more progress in your poker career, go over to their site, pokerambition.com and find out which service is best for you. But without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Hello, my fellow ambitious poker players, and welcome back to another episode here on the Mechanics of Poker podcast. In which today we will have Tobias Dutweiler, aka Dot One, on the podcast. He's a high stakes cash game player and was one of the biggest winners last year. To have Tobias on actually was a recommendation of fellow grew up in a small town in Germany poker player Stefan Goosecourt Sandheimer. And we are very happy that he did. Apparently, you know, growing up in a small town of Germany is some sort of, how do they call that, Adam? A talent hotbed? Mm hmm. Correct, yeah, like a hotspot. Yeah, like you have in... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like the Kenyans in their running hotspots where you have a breed of people who seem to be very successful in one endeavor in a very small community. And it has this kind of winning effect where more and more people either come to that area or the culture promotes more winners. So yeah, he's definitely from one of those communities. And yeah, it should be a very interesting conversation. It's his first public podcast. So hopefully we get to share his story in a very good way. He's had a very diverse background. So some of the stories that we're hopefully going to bring out today will be very different to what you've heard from other players. He struggled a lot on his journey to the top, which I like. I like that when someone has to overcome adversity, I can relate to uh, facing obstacles. So I really want to bring out his kind of trials and tribulations on his route to the high stakes. And yeah, hopefully we can share his story in a way that resonates with the audience. So anything from you, Renny, that you're looking forward to from today's guest? Yeah, I'm curious. Do remind me if I didn't ask that uh, if... If he knows what it is about this small time towns in Germany that makes it such a talent hotbed for poker players. I actually also, uh, he mentioned that we was playing poker for, I think, only five years, which actually mm -hmm. so far that of people that we have on, usually they've been playing longer. I would say that he's been the fastest riser through to get to high stakes. So I'm sure there are some things there that we can learn from. So without further ado, uh, let's have him on. Welcome to Bias. This time I'm correcting myself to the podcast. Hey, welcome guys. I'm happy to join you. Well, this is actually, you mentioned this was the first time that you ever been on a podcast. We are, uh, me and Adam, we're very honored that you agreed to be on ours to share your poker journey with the world. Uh, I was talking with Guscor, who we had on a couple of episodes ago. Uh, it was a good friend of yours. He told me to ask your, about your background as it's probably a bit different than other poker players. It was actually also something that you mentioned in the questionnaire. Could you tell us about your job before poker and how that has helped you gain perspective of how, and I quote, you wrote, blessed we are as poker players? Um, yes. So uh, first of all, you two guys have been the first ones to ask me on a podcast. So uh, that, that might have helped for, for me joining for the first time. Uh, but yes, so so far to be fair, um, yeah, I was, I was mostly trying to to stay a bit, uh, yeah, under the radar and not like, um, yeah, yeah, go out there and, and share a lot from from uh, my poker uh, journey. But yeah, um, again, happy happy to join you. Um, yeah, uh, might might be cool for some people to to uh, yeah get get some uh, get some infos about. Yeah, how you get there, how you how how some people got there. I mean, in the first episodes, uh, we we saw that as well, for, like different ways. So yeah, and as you mentioned, uh, I'm having a different background than than most of the poker players. Uh, I was actually uh, after I finished finished school, I was actually working for four and a half years, I think, like one and a half or five years. Uh, yeah, I was working with uh, mentally disabled children. Um, and yeah, definitely, definitely a really, really good experience for me to have. Um, yeah, just in a way that, um, yeah, 
seeing what's really out there, what's, um, yeah, what, what, what actually life is about and what, what matters and not like, yeah, having, uh, yeah, having to worry about uh, a card game or, yeah, about some, some minor stuff that we sometimes, um, yeah, think about or worry about. So, so yeah. Uh, also, I was working in a, um, yeah, in a group of, I think, six children. Uh, and yeah, it was, was mostly, yeah, like I said before, mentally disabled children. They were taken out from their families. Parents had some issues with, um, yeah, with the education. So, so yeah. Um, and then they, they got some professional help from me and my coworkers. Uh, yeah, really, really, uh, Cool experience, but also very challenging experience um, to to yeah to to yeah um, deal with like like real I say real problems. I don't know like how it's difficult to describe, but yeah, very um, yeah very challenging for sure. And I'm I'm like like I said in the question, I'm I'm super happy I've done it. Uh, I would have never changed that time for anything. Uh, yeah, uh, really feel like this giving me bigger bigger side on, on most of the stuff up until today is that something that let's say for example in poker you're going through some troubles you're going to a downswing or something does that experience with children do you then think back at that and be like oh actually <laughs> my problems are nothing um on a daily basis i'd say no because while being in game uh it's it's i mean it's possible to think about stuff like that right like like you're so you're so focused and like like you're like just thinking about a hand or what what's going on right now and only in the poker mindset but uh especially after a session like day after like like let's say you have a really bad session like a day or two after and then you you like put it in a in a bit of a bigger picture um then it's definitely helping um but yeah, it would have, it would have. I mean, I would lie if I say it, like while I'm playing, I have this in my mind and think about that. Um, that it's yeah, that that poker is nothing. I mean, while you're playing, I think you guys can relate, right? Like you play, uh, in the middle of a session, the session is everything. Like you focus on that and not on your on everything else, what's going on. So so yeah, would definitely yeah, would definitely be be uh, like to say that. But but in a bigger picture, it helps for sure, really. Yeah, I guess it helps you not stay in a negative frame for too long. Uh, yes, for sure, for sure. Let's say you leave the office and you go out and then you, you're in the real world again and it's like, yeah, everything is gone. Like when you think about that stuff. I love it how us poker players refer to the rest of the world as the real world, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, like uh, it's, it's, it's not um, like... Uh, it does, doesn't want to, like, I, I mean, I'm not smaller than things so that uh, when, when I say the reader world, I mean, like, I think the poker world is not a reader world. So, so that's why I'm saying like, uh, like there's a real world out there where most of us live in a pretty big bubble, I'd say, um, like, for example, I'm living here with like a lot of, um, like poker players in my, diff uh, in my, um, yeah, my surrounding, my daily, daily surroundings. So. Yeah, uh, it's easy to drift off in the poker world and not realize that there's actually a real world out there that is, <laughs> that is way more important or that is like the, the real life. What is it about being a poker player, as I quote you, that makes us so blessed? Mm, yeah, I think it's mostly a combination of probably earning more money than most people do in regular jobs and the freedom to like, yeah, spend your time whatever way you want and like work as much as you want or as little as you want and then yeah get like the the money wise the result is uh, the, the the reward is really big um and then you have a lot of free time obviously you have a lot of money and so i mean that that's a really good combination i think for for doing whatever you want in life right let's say you grind for a couple of years and then afterwards you're pretty much done and i don't know like like i have a lot of a lot of friends from from my hometown i'm still yeah friends with a lot of the guys from there and i see like how their lives go what what they what they do like how they build their families like how they build their houses and like how much they have to actually work for that and what effort they have to put in and then you think like okay you're just sitting there playing cards and earning like yeah x times the amount or what they do and 
yeah, that's that's something I think is, is like yeah we we often forget about like that is not not something that is that is very um, yeah that that is um, yeah that's normal I don't know like how to say it. it's just not normal. No, 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 I I understand what you mean. You now also made it sound like you know poker is quite easy compared to other jobs, right? But as we all both know. Sometimes it feels like the hardest job in the world. You're like, why the fuck did I choose this profession? Obviously, everything you just said, rationally speaking, you know, makes it easy to put things in perspective. But as you also mentioned, in the middle of a session or after a bad session, you sometimes feel like, why did I do that? Why did I leave my village in Germany? Why don't I just, you know, why didn't I just marry the girl down the street, have have a family work across the street, you know, and have a have a nice, quote, quote, normal life, right? But uh, I'm sure... Throughout this podcast, we will talk about uh, some of the struggles that you had through poker as well, because you know it's never smooth sailing through the top. Another thing that you mentioned that probably also had an impact on your poker career is that you played a lot of handball growing up. And I don't know if you you also mentioned you still play a lot of sports. Maybe you still play handball, but at that point you were close to a semi-professional level. Um, you also mentioned you were very competitive, which surprise, surprise, I think everyone has said so far who is on this podcast. So clearly if you're, if you're a poker player, you're quite competitive. Um, which things did you learn through handball that helped you transition well into a competitive game like poker? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's actually, I think there's actually quite, quite a lot of similarities. Um, uh, also there's quite a lot of difference i think like especially for for handball um you're, you're playing a team right so so whenever you're having a bad day or um yeah you're just not performing on the level you think you, you should perform you can perform there, there's always some some guy next to you that helps you out that is that is there for you and you say okay it's just not my day okay you go ahead to the uh, and do it that that's something especially in poker right like you have a bad day like it's you like like you you have to you have to fight on your own and you have to you have to get out there and, and try to get your best. Um, but but yeah, sometimes it's just not meant to be, or like you you're just not like your 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 thoughts are not not really there. So yeah, but um, again, like also in sports, you, you sometimes you you're playing good, you're playing bad. Uh, I think you have to learn to live with that. And uh, I played for close to twenty years, I think, and you you learn it throughout the years. And I think that's the same for poker, right? Like like you just have days where you play really good and you think you're the king of the world. And then you have days where, yeah, you, you make a play and 10 minutes later you think like, Jesus, what the fuck did I do here? I mean, that is that me? Um, and then, yeah, you, you just have to have to like, yeah, have that in mind and say, okay, it's just my day and not my day. It's like, it happens to everybody. Like, like right? Like sometimes you play good, sometimes you play bad. Today I play bad, but it's not something to, to hate yourself about uh, for it's, yeah, tomorrow's another day, keep going. And yeah, you, you you get that in sports a lot. Like like yeah, you win, you lose. Uh, most important is you keep keep carrying on. So it's like the accepting of the fact that there's sort of ranges in your game, right? Even in handball, you have your A game, your B game, your C game. And it sounds like through handball, you learn to be empathetic towards yourself. That some days, you know, it's just not your day, and you learn to not beat yourself up too much about it. Yeah, I think so. I think so. To be fair, I'm not the best at that still. Like I'm still in the progress of learning. Um, but but yeah, it definitely helps and it definitely uh helped a lot over the years for sure. You you mentioned that uh, obviously handball team sport, uh poker. I mean poker can be a team sport. Do you do you look do do you approach poker more as an individual or do you really have like a team around you, study buddies. Do you try to find that team spirit in poker as well? Um, yeah, a bit of both, I'd say. Like nowadays, it's mostly me on my own. Like, let's say last one and a half years, last two years, it's probably me on my own. I mean, I have a, I have a bunch of friends here uh, in Vienna, uh, all poker players, but we were not really starting together. Like, like um, uh, yeah, two of them are um, mid to high stakes, no limit players. The others are uh, PLO players. Uh, others are tournament players. Um, so yeah, and and we're mostly we're 
when we talk about poker a lot, but we we are mostly just friends. And um, so so yeah, it's it's yeah when it comes to that, me on my own. But before that, to be fair, um, I mean, I, I'm not sure I, I said that somewhere in the questions, but I was like, uh, I was working with Uri Pelik a lot um, with the Korea poker guys. Um, and I was actually there when the when they started. We were like a small group of like four or five guys and we were pretty much studying together all the time. It was like only us and like the core group. And I think everybody of that core group is still there actually. Um, but but yeah, that was that was really like a team. Like we were like four or five guys, everybody playing the same games on a daily base, and yeah, like like playing mornings, studying afternoons. Um, but yeah, over the years, it was just like going a bit in different directions. Like like everybody chose like some different games. Um, some of the guys still like more on yeah more on mid stakes. Uh, I was obviously. Uh, yeah, lucky that I just like ran up the stakes very fast, and 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 then came to came to like, uh, yeah, a bit of a higher level than them than them. So so yeah, at this point again, like just just because of different games, different stakes, it's it's mostly um, me on my own. I mean, uh, as you know, I'm playing like all the stakes out there, and there's just not a lot of guys that that play all these stakes. And if if so, I mean, obviously you you don't ask your 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 daily opponent like okay let's go study together i mean it's like like everybody's out there yeah themselves. <laughs> i can understand also from i uh, we're usually motivated to study with someone better than us but then i guess if you know you play like 5k and higher i mean who are you gonna ask the the person who would then help you is also your direct competitor right and this mm -hmm. is also when you're playing mid six i think it's way easier to all group together and try to get better together because also there are so much games to choose from right you don't have to battle it out against each other at the tables non-stop right unless that's something that you really want i remember in our cfp i would open up uh the 5 10 table on poker stars i would see four of my students battling it out with each other I'm like okay yeah these guys they they like they like to battle it out you know and i i let them because you know i, I would have done exactly the same so i i can understand that uh but yeah it that that is indeed that that is indeed a dilemma. Well, if you ever need a study buddy, Tobias, you know you can just call me up. Uh, you know we don't play we 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 don't play with each other, so Thank that, you. that's not a problem. Appreciate it. Um, you were also referring to uh, to go back to the difference between a team sport and an individual sport. When your teammates uh, kind of screw up in a certain game, how do you deal with that? Like in poker, you know, if you screw up, it's you screwing up in a hand, right? You have no one else to blame. But in handball, you can be here in your top, but then the rest of your team sort of lets you down. How how did you handle with that? Um, to be honest, that's something I've never thought about. Um, because like all of, all of the guys that I played with, like we we were like like practicing like three or four times a week, then having a game at the weekend. Like basically, you, basically you spent like almost all your free time with them. And you're really good friends with them. So it's like, I don't know, like you, you don't even get that feeling. Like somebody doesn't play well, he doesn't play well. It's not like, okay, come on, you are letting me down. It's like, we're all in there together. It's like, it's like us together against the other team. And it's, it's, it's not like, okay. I mean, like obviously nobody's playing shit on purpose. It's like, I mean, yeah, yeah. it's, it's not like, okay, you, you let us down. It's like, okay, you, you didn't, you didn't perform well. It's fine. I mean, we, we are there. We got you. We are one team. Like we win together. We lose together. I mean, it sounds a bit like, yeah, like, like every football interview you see out there, but that's really how it is. Like I, I've never, never had that feeling like, okay, the, the guy on my right or the guy on my left, they let me down and we win because of him. It's like, okay, we lost because we weren't good enough as a team. Um, and that's it. Yeah, well, I've seen uh, Cristiano Ronaldo look at his teammates sometimes, and I'm like, okay, I'm not really sure if he's showing the same empathy as the not Tobias really, is doing. Not now. really sure if Cristiano Ronaldo is friends with like all the 21 other guys. <laughs> so. uh, I I doubt it as well, but <laughs> I, I I understand, right? You're realizing that everyone can go through a range in their game any given day. Everyone is trying to give their best, right? No one is fucking up on purpose. And again, it's the empathy towards your fellow teammates. Uh, Adam, you, you know, I know that you're a runner. We talked about this in some previous episodes. It's also individual sport. Have you also done any team sports? 
Not overly much, to be honest. I did a bit of football or soccer for you Americans when I was younger. But to be honest, I was never very good at it. And my dad was a runner when he was younger. So he edged me towards doing running when I was 11 or 12. And I was training like three, four, five times a week very quickly by the time I was 13, competing in races around the country. So uh, I didn't really have that much energy to compete in team sports. So yeah, not too much, to be honest. And yeah, for some reason, I've always edged towards more individual competition, whether that was tennis, whether that was running, whether that was weightlifting in the gym, something where I control the variables. But I do get like why team sports can be so appealing. Like that kind of brotherhood where you're working towards a common goal. You're all spending so much time together, training together. So in running, I had this where basically we do like team events around the country where six of us, our six best runners, would go and race against the other six best teams in the country. And we had this like, right, let's go beat everyone. Let's all join together. Let's all bring our A game. And exactly what Tobias was saying, there's no like kind of, you did bad, you let us down. Everyone's trying to do their best. Everyone's trying to uh, help the team. But yeah, I haven't got that much experience in team sports, to be honest, but individual sports, uh, yeah, I'm definitely a big advocate. So yeah, what I'm getting from you here, which I find really interesting is the kind of balanced life perspective, which like is really interesting for poker players. I find a lot of players end up going into poker quite young, like say 17, 18, perhaps haven't had that much life experience, maybe they've went to university, but for you, it feels like helping the mentally disabled people, that must be, or the children, sorry, that must help your life perspective hugely because you're doing something very much external for other people. You're bringing out empathy, your care inside, and you're figuring out like the bigger picture of life and how to care for others. Then you've got your kind of handball experience where you're very competitive, you're in a team environment and you're trying to bring out your best attributes to help others in the team. And then at some point, which we're going to go into in a second, you transition into poker, which was could be classed as quite an individual pursuit where you're trying to pursue your own goals. So uh, we've got all these kind of components coming together, with like, which in my, my opinion creates a kind of balanced perspective and a balanced human who often does very well at what they decide to specialize in. So uh, for you, poker, talk us through uh, how that began. So we've got handball going on for 20 years, very competitive. When did poker first come onto your radar? Um... Poker came up first. I'd say the last year I finished school, that was in 2010, 2010. I think that was like the first poker boom pretty much. I don't know when, when it grew, Chris Moneymaker won like 2.6, 2.7 or something. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, like, around 2.6, yeah. Yeah, around then, yeah. Around that time. So, so yeah, that was, that was like a time when, when, yeah, you could pro pretty much watch every poker show on, on TV, like every day, every evening. Um, and yeah, obviously, like like couple couple of young young lads together, um, you you'll sit there in the evening, have a beer, and okay, why not why not try and play poker? Um, so so yeah, then I mean probably like it started for most of the guys sitting sitting there with friends, uh, like like figuring out rules online, and then like okay, let's just play. And yeah, like I was playing obviously with my friends from sport and. Everybody was super competitive that started, that started playing, and we were playing for cents. I, I don't I remember, I think like one cent, two cent cash game, maybe with like 50 cent buy in. I, I don't know, like, like some, some weird format, but but yeah, everybody like got hooked up pretty fast. And I was like, okay, this, 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 this seems cool because, uh, like, yeah, of all the stuff that makes poker so cool, right? Like, like everybody can win, like, everybody thinks he's ahead of the other guy. Like, obviously, we were all just like, like, nobody had an idea what's going on, but everybody was like trying to figure it out his own way. And um, so, so yeah, and then, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much how, how it started. And we played evenings and then like went on pretty fast. We, we were with like, yeah, free, free, um, when we had free time while at school, we would just sit in, in the school building and play there. And yeah, and then, I don't know, like start playing five euro S and cheese on the weekends and like yeah, yeah, and then then going going from there and um yeah, I don't know, like at some point you'll you'll try to figure out to not go to your home game, you'll you'll go to the local casino for the first time and yeah, that's that's how it all started. Yeah. So it sounds like your initial motivation was probably to beat your friends and to not <laughs> lose to them. It sounds like all you guys are probably going for each other. It's funny, it reminds me of my, when I first played poker, I was at university, I was probably 18, and we, one of the guys was really into it, so he like introduced us to the, the game and stuff, and then we'd play around this little table for the equivalent of $10. That $10 was like 
not the money was kind of big at the time, but it was more just like beat your friends was just such a big thing. And yeah, you do anything to win those games. So yeah, I can relate to that. And then all of a sudden, someone starts going to the casino, someone starts reading a few books, and you're like, all right, wait a second, this is getting a bit serious. And then you start wanting to compete. So for you, how did that transition? When did you transition out of just playing home games with your friends to something a little bit more serious? Was there a, an escalation where you started playing at casinos or online? What was the initial transition for you? Um, yeah has to be split up in two parts i think because first time we really thought okay let's give it a shot we will go to the local casino um was maybe like one or two years after we started playing and i think the lowest game running there was like like end of 400 i think and i, I was just finished school at this point and like obviously i had zero money so so this was like a really really big game and i was like okay let's let's just give it a shot um and yeah, actually it went really, really well. Um so we went there. Um yeah, we, we won the first sessions, uh then lost a bit, then then won and then um yeah, went on a really big upswing. And again, like I'm 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 just a pure fisher that's at this point like have no idea what's going on. Um yeah, and then then I just just yeah, basically me and one of the friends from home, like we were both on a pretty big heater, I'd say, and we ran it up and then Obviously, like like you have like yeah, let's say you have one k in the bank, and suddenly you have like ten k in the bank. Like like okay, let's go. Like there's a five ten game in the casino as well. Let's let's let's. I mean, you you win every session. You have to go and, and play that. It's obviously, <laughs> but uh, yeah, then we we kept up running, uh, kept running it up, and yeah, at some point I think like one like maybe two years or three years after we started playing once and two cent, I had like yeah. I think like 20 or 30 K like one in the local casino by, by, yeah, just by running super pure. And obviously like half a year later, I lost it all uh, because like I was, I was a fish. Uh, and then I, um, and then, yeah, I, I, I started working. Uh, so, so yeah, that has like that. That was the first part that, yeah. Um, yeah. Making transition first, then losing it all being broke like okay what what uh, am i going to do here uh, at some point i have to start to figure out uh, to get a job figure out what i want to do in life and um yeah but while while working i was mostly like then studying on the side because i was so offended by by losing uh, in the local casino and i was like <laughs> i was like okay no i i i can't take this like i i know these guys are like super bad like it's it's Basically, what you said before, like at some point you get a book, you read something, and even though I'm still a big fish at this point, like I know the guys are bad. I'm like, no, no, that's not how it's ending. Uh, but yeah, I'm super broke. I start to <laughs> work, and then like I start, I think I start, yes, yeah, start properly studying and playing like one cent, two cent online on the side uh, while while uh, while working for four years, which is obviously super super painful after having like like twenty or thirty k suddenly out of nowhere, and then you. You go back and play one cent, two cent. Um, but on the other hand, really, really helpful experience for me. Um, so that's that's why I'm openly sharing it. I mean, it's not one of my proudest moments, obviously, like 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 being super young, running it up, and then going broke. Uh, but yeah, uh, in hindsight, probably the best best thing that could have happened. Uh, so so yes, I, I would um, then split it up, like like making transition start working and then like do a proper transition to poker or, like on the side like just just regular working 40 hours a week and then like like doing it on the side um and and like properly studying and, and then after that going back to the casino and crushing the guys <laughs> yeah i love that story so yeah it sounds like those first two years went like a bit of a whirlwind from like having a 1k roll to like a 20 30k roll and then it came crashing down back to reality and it's like oh shit maybe i'm not as good as i thought what i found really interesting about that was the phrase you said is this is not how the story ends this is not how the story ends and i really like that because it's really easy in those moments especially when you've had it easy it's very hard to like just rebuild and go wait a second maybe i wasn't as good as i thought i was maybe i need to get good now because you kind of already had the success you had like 20 30k very easily it's quite hard to drop the ego go back to part-time job rebuild the role, start playing lower stakes, just to come back and go, right, I'm going to do better next time. So uh, yeah, I think that's a big sign of your character, maybe a sign of your competitive drive as well to want to beat these guys. But yeah, I really like that you uh, use that phrase, "Not this is not where the story ends. So then it sounds like you uh, changed your approach to Porter completely. You started studying more. So yeah, talk us through that transition from being, let's say, a fishy player in those kind of games 
to actually being able to beat the game. So uh, when you started studying, when did you realize that, wait a second, I can actually beat these games long term? Was there a, tr a transition point where you almost turned pro or you realized that there was going to be a, a long term win rate in, in the games for you? Um, so, yeah, I think like there was not a real, real point where I turned pro before actually when I was done working. I think I had like a contract for. Um, like first time it was like one year, one year, and then I had like a two and a half year contract or something. Um, and um, yeah, I was mostly like playing on side while while working, and um, yeah, I think the uh, got most of the content from the the poker strategy forum. Uh, there was there was big back in the day, and yeah, just just basically read everything that's on there. Started started a blog, and I mean. I, I still knew poker basics, so there was probably enough of that time to like beat like up to NL10 online pro, I think. So so yeah, I was, I was grinding it up pretty fast, and I was yeah, I was working 40 hours a week. I was like spending 10, 12 hours in the in the handball gym, and then yeah, basically every every second free time I had, I was just playing poker. Like I would, I would skip like going out on the weekend with friends. I would skip like basically everything and just just like. Yeah, trying to trying to get the, the the work done and like like get better and then think like first year of the last contract I had on work I started playing NL fifty and actually that was the first time when I when I um yeah when I played online where I had a bit of of um yeah downswing or like just just a just a like the like time frame where I didn't didn't like get better or like I didn't realize I get better at least. I was just like break even, like like playing, yeah, you know, a lot of hands still, um, but but not really getting forward. And then I decided to get a coach at this point, and that was actually uh, Stefan uh, Gusko. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's the, that's the first time we meet, like in like at least meet online, and yeah, I don't know what that was, should be to fourteen to fifteen, I think. Uh, yeah, he he was like playing mid stakes already online i think at this point and i was just yeah just this nl50 fish <laughs> and then um yeah uh yeah I, I got him as my coach and that really really helped me like like he opened my eyes for for a lot of stuff and then um yeah af after that um i just skyrocketed to nl200 i think while while still working and yeah when last year of the work of, of, of working started i was like making already a lot of money on and not a lot but um i was already making decent money on the side playing in l200 and that was the first time i really thought okay hmm, why maybe not give it a real shot and go pro um and yeah i mean again like most motivation was to just like be able to play in the local casino weekends i would have, i would have done like a five day working week go there saturday sunday crush those guys take like one or two k on the weekend and just go back to work and, and have that on the side that would like have, have been totally uh, satisfying for me but but yeah then I, I like depending on how good online went i was like okay hmm, maybe local casino 510 is not the, is, that's not the limit maybe there's maybe there's more out there um and yeah and then i then i think i took my whole yearly vacation during the last year and like did something like a yeah like a test i was just like taking like three weeks off work and i was like basically locking myself uh in, in my room at home like three weeks and like saying okay let's just simu simulate i'm a pro like let's get up at a certain time let's grind eight hours let's let's see how that goes how do i feel with that can i make it do i feel like like this is something that that is that is satisfying me and yeah uh, after that, uh, after that three weeks, uh, I told I told my parents, okay, uh, that's it. I'm, I'm done with working. I'll, I'll give it a shot, and uh, if it doesn't work out, whatever, I'll go back to work. It's it's no big deal. I, I love working. I love I love being there. It's 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 yeah. But but I really wanna. I really just wanna give it a shot. Like if if I don't do it, I, I might just I might just hate myself for not not trying it afterwards. Wow, so many good things in there that I want to elaborate on. So the first part was when you talked about playing NL50 and you experienced your first downswing. And you said that during that period, it felt like potentially you weren't growing or improving as a player during that. And it's quite a difficult period for you. And you ended up reaching out to Gusko, who was playing mid stakes at the time. 
What was it about that period that made you reach out for a coach? How were you feeling about your game? Were you feeling trapped, lost? And at what point did you decide, you know what, I can't figure this out by myself. I'm going to have to uh, get some input from a coach. Uh, I think that happened pretty quickly, actually. Like, mm, I really felt like that. I'm, I'm, yeah. Mm, my my thought process was capped at some point. Like, I, 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 I had like I knew I knew the stuff that was like working till then. But then the, you face new players, and at this point, I was like, really okay. I can't figure out on what they are doing. Like, like why? Like, you see stuff, and you see stuff that you haven't seen before, and you realize there's something different going on, but. I couldn't just like like think outside of the box and think, okay, hey, this this or that, I have to switch this, and this is what he's doing. I'll, I'll do the other. I'll do the do it the other way. Uh, yeah, I was just like so yeah, so so stuck in like the, the the stuff I did before because it worked up to that point, and then I was yeah, think happened pretty quickly, like maybe like forty k hands or something. I was like, okay, um, I'll I'll just need help, and and this is. Also, I think when you when you look back at at handball or like um, um, yeah team sports, whenever you 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 don't figure out something on yourself, it's like it's easy to get help from outside. And I was, um, it's maybe maybe harder for yourself if you never have taken help from outside or never had the opportunity to take help from outside. But I I had it all my life, and like like I always had like people around me or like coaches that that would just like yeah say okay hey. Maybe this is not the best way you're doing it, but like, why not try this way? And so, yeah, I, I didn't have like the, um, I don't know, there's, there's something I think also personally in it. Like, okay, it's it's like, if you say, okay, I couldn't figure it out on myself. It's not like, okay, I'm not good enough or something. It's just like, maybe I just need like a little help and then I'll figure it out myself. And this is funny because actually like, like later on I had this, um, I had this again where the, the then when I when I joined the the, the Korea program, guys, I had the exact same thing on on like Zoom 500 that, that I was like like yeah I was kind of crushing it and then at some point just not everything was not going going further anymore and I was yeah and then I realized it really quickly because I have been there before and um so so yeah this is this is I think um again because of me being used to getting help from outside. Uh, I, I could have made, or oh, I made this probably a lot quicker than, than than other people would have done it. Yeah, it seems like throughout your life, you've not struggled to ask for help. You've always had coaches around you, probably from your handball days. I'm guessing you had a, a good coaching environment there. And I think for you, you can tell that asking for help is seen as more of a strength or just an optimal strategy. Whereas for some people, asking for help is a big ego boot, it's kind of ego knock it almost makes them feel bad about themselves but yeah you said a few times that when you uh, couldn't solve a problem for you to ask for a little bit of help was not a problem like it didn't uh, create any resistance for you so yeah i think that's definitely a skill set which 100 percent will help you move up in life quicker definitely a lot of people will be stuck in life uh, almost not, not refusing to ask for help but like a bit scared to to reach out to somebody who could give them solutions and as you said when you work with goose your results skyrocketed i'm guessing they opened up your eyes to a, a whole new way of thinking about poker and I really like what you said as you were transitioning. I think you said you were playing the 200 NL games and you were starting to make good profit online. And you still had your job on the side and you're trying to figure out your kind of path. I really like what you said about doing these kind of three-week tests. So I really like you were basically going, I'm going to be a pro for three weeks. I'm going to live the pro experience and I'm going to see how it feels. I'm going to see if I like it. I'm going to see if it's for me. I think that's so huge. I've, I've spoken with many players who are kind of part-time thinking about going full-time and it's so hard to explain like how it feels unless you do it there's nothing like the, the full experience see so, yeah, i really like that you were giving yourself these kind of three-week crash courses to go uh, does it feel good can i picture myself doing this is there any lessons that you learned on those three weeks is there any of any times any of those three weeks that are, are memorable looking back where you're like ah things clicked during this three weeks or i was like yes i could see myself playing any any, any stories like that hmm uh probably not a lot of stories because i mean the three weeks were just really boring right i was just sitting in my room like grinding like 10 hours a day every day uh, i think most or like biggest takeaway from that was like really okay i'm not getting frustrated from playing 10 hours a day i'm mm. like i'm really enjoying it like it's it's not like i played like 10 hours and, and probably 10 hours is actually a bit less uh, uh like uh, a bit, uh yeah a little explanation i think like maybe played like 12 hours some days, maybe sometimes 14, because like what, what I'm going to do all day. Um, and yeah, I was really like, I was 
grinding, going to sleep and getting up and like, okay, nice. I want to do that again. It's, it's like, it's still, it's still fun. It's, it's not um, like, like, yeah, I, I'm getting frustrated after, after a bad day or two, or I'm getting frustrated after a week, not seeing anybody, I mean, not seeing anybody is, this is not true. I mean, I'm still like going to sports in the evenings and then going out, but um, yeah. I was I was just like yeah getting a good feeling from it like that that that's probably all all it took like I was sitting there playing and enjoying it and like, okay if I can enjoy that for like a week if for two or for three like why not enjoy this for a year or two or even longer yeah yeah and that's the thing isn't it? it's the feel it's the feel for it which is so hard to like conceptualize you can write your goals down and how you think it was gonna go for forever but until you put ten hours in twelve hours. 14 hours into something a day and go, right, am I going to burn out from this? Do I get bored of it? Do I get frustrated? Are my emotions all of a sudden more intense during this period? If you can see yourself doing that for three weeks, then for six months and a year, all of a sudden it's a proof of concept that, wait a second, maybe I could do this full time. And that's what you were doing. You were testing whether this could be a full time avenue. So I really like those kind of three week little experiments. Myself, when I started poker, me and my friends did a bit more extreme version where we, uh, we're playing in our kind of home, we're each in different cities, playing in our kind of parents' house. And we decided we'd get a villa in Thailand and we'd have three month rents paid up front and we'd just play poker for three months. If we went broke, we went broke. We, we begged our parents to fly us home, but we're going to go crash course. And we just 10, 10 hours a day, same, same, th same thing. Can we make this game work? Can we beat the game enough to make money? And will we like it? And we had no clue of either of those questions till we did it. And on those three months, we're like, all right, we can see ourselves doing it. Games seem like we can make a profit to support ourselves. Let's do another three months. That became six months, which became uh, six years. So uh, yeah, I think it's really good to test yourself in. Sometimes it feels risky. I, I think your, your version was less risky than mine. But at the same time, when you're young, you're trying to figure things out. You've got so much opportunity to uh, almost like fail, but like fail by winning. It's like a win-win scenario. I think you said even, even if those poker avenues didn't work out, who cares? It would have been a fun experience. You would have learned something. And then you could have moved on to the next part of your life with that experience behind you. So it's like a... Yeah, almost like a free roll in, in some respects. So uh, yeah, I really like that. And yeah, so for you, uh, it sounds like your, you had Gusco as a coach during this period. How was your environment overall? It sounds like some of your friends were also trying to make their way in poker or at least trying to beat the casino games. Did you have much support in your environment during that time? Um, yeah, so, so I'd say. Um, like, I think at this point, the, the guys that start, I started playing with in the beginning, most of them were, were probably done with poker. They also started like a real job. We were just a bunch of like like yeah early twenty twenties guys. So so yeah, the, they just they just started working and yeah they they, they just didn't have like the, the the drive and not not meaning that in a negative way, but like it's like when I look back now, I mean working forty hours doing sports and playing twenty hours poker a week is a lot of time you have to spend with with like stuff that takes your energy and um. Yeah, a lot of them just they started working and they were pretty much done. And so so it was mainly me on my own at that point. Um yeah, my, my close friends, they they were really supporting me. Uh they were they were supporting me from the beginning. They uh, were they, they told me, Okay, I mean, we think you can do that. We we believe in you. Um, even though especially in the beginning when uh, yeah, when I started out, um, yeah, running it up, being broke, uh, grinding it back again. Like, ob I think obviously everybody around my myself, like, yeah, got uh, like a bit, yeah, a bit worried when when they see this. Like, okay, this is something that can happen. Like, this is, I mean, lo losing twenty k and being broke is like a really big deal for for a lot of people. Um, and and like like this is this is something where where they they I think they got. Yeah, at least they thought about it. Like maybe not worried, but they thought about it. Uh, but but they still were were really supportive and thinking and saying, okay, we believe you can do that. But then they were like, was like a total different camp. Like like a lot of my um my my handful of teammates back in the day, they they were like, they were were basically telling me like, yeah, I mean, what what are you doing with your time? Like when when are you broke? Like how long does it take? When do you go back to work? I mean. Uh, why not spend your time on something more, um, yeah, on something um, where you can be more successful, where where you where you get some reward and like, um, and at some point I was like not uh, not going to daily practice anymore. I was like thinking we had like three practice a week, and I was like skipping one at that point because there was the game in the casino like for Thursday evening, I think, and that was the day where we had practice, and I was like, okay, I mean, 
I'm fine practicing two times a week. I'm still okay at handball, but like I need to go there. It's it's big. <laughs> and and they were like telling me like, what the fuck are you going to do? Like like why why you go play poker instead of playing or practicing handball with us? And I mean yeah, that they they are really like like not not happy about it. And I mean in hindsight, <laughs> whenever I come home, I mean I'm still good friends with all of them. It's like it's not like like I'm happy that I. I've proven them wrong, but it's still, yeah, it's still kind of nice to talk to them like like today and say like, ah, you look, maybe maybe it was good. Like I skipped the practice or two. It's like <laughs> I'm not not playing playing handball Champions League nowadays, but I mean, hope it works out a bit a bit better. So so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like you had a little bit of, like of a mixed, like some support and some people supporting you, some people worrying about you, some people going, "Come on, like get back to practice with handball, stop wasting your life." And I feel like it's very, very common for poker players to uh, definitely not have universal support. I mean, I've, I'm, I don't think I've met any poker player who had a very supportive family, very supportive friends, and everyone was like, "Yay, go you, play poker." I think there's always an element of worrying about you. Are you being reckless? Have you got this figured out? Do you know what you're doing? You spent your whole life building these skills, going to university. Are you sure you want to throw it away on this game? And you're like, give me a break. Let me figure this out. So yeah, it sounds like you had enough support around you. Some friends who were yeah, basically cheer, cheering you on. I do feel like it is important to, if you haven't got support in your environment, you need to find some because poker is so hard to do it alone. And if you're just like me against the world mentality, yep, that can get you started. But at some point you're going to need a support system. So yeah, it sounds like along the way you found it, you had Goose Core as a coach very early as well to uh, kind of support you. So yeah, it sounds like you found that kind of solution in your environment. Mm -hmm. So Renny, any questions you've got from the first chapter of his poker career? I mean, it requires also a lot of confidence, right? For you, you went broke, right? So the, 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 the facts were that indeed you considered yourself a fish. Uh, I think it's normal uh, if you if you share the story of you going broke to your environment, they want to protect you and be like, hey, Tobias, this is not a great idea. Remember what happened last time. But despite that and despite, so despite your experience and despite what people were saying, you still had the confidence to say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make that. Where, where do you think this confidence comes from? That's a tough question, but um overconfidence is, is something i'm not like having an issue with like ever so so i don't know like uh tough tough to say like well, whenever I, I really i really wanted to do something i was just going through it and and um yeah i think when when, when i have something in my mind that i'm like I'm like 100 focused on it i'm most i think i'm probably always uh succeeded so far uh it's a bit a bit different with other stuff where when when there's stuff like i have to do or stuff that i feel like ah maybe i can do it uh but but i'm not really sure it's it's the it's 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 exactly what i want I, i'm i'm struggling often so so i'm failing a lot of, in a lot of lot of stuff but when when i have something on my mind where i'm like 100 percent sure i can do it and i want to do it um yeah it always worked out and with poker i i just had it like like you know it was but handball was kind of decent, I'd say. I was not, I was not, not crushing, but I was decent, and I was always having like decent confidence there as well. And with poker, I felt like, yeah, I can be way, way better there, and I knew it. And it's like, it's, I mean, it's, it's stupid to say I knew it, but at, at some point, somewhere in my mind, I, I just knew it. I, I was like, okay, I'm pretty sure I can be better than most of the guys. And uh, if it's not today, it's not tomorrow. Okay, uh, but but yeah, I'll. I'll, I'll i'll just give it a shot and yeah i just, just had a confidence uh by the way when just just one more thing um concerning the uh environment i, I totally forgot to mention my parents when parents when we were just talking about friends supporting uh yeah uh like my mom uh, shout out to my mom um <laughs> she she was uh yeah she was really really worried um especially after i went broke for the first time like she she was like okay like I think she was a bit relieved when I went broke for the first time because okay now poker is done and I can go back to work and I just can work and when when I told her like like after that like three years later I told her okay I'm quitting my job I'm going to be a poker player like yeah uh, she was she was hating it she was really hating it I'm pretty sure uh, but yeah uh, nowadays uh, yeah uh, she she's she's really supportive uh, it, it changed a lot over the years and. Um, yeah, but but in the in the first uh, in the first place, that was like really a big shock for her, and um, yeah, 
but but again uh it worked out and now it's at some point at some point she she realized okay this i'm probably not going to be broke next month again this is this is something that's it's very unlikely to to happen um so, so yeah no yeah i mean my mother was exactly the same but when your mother sees that you've been invited to a podcast, you know, for the normal world, it's like, oh, apparently he made it, right? He's 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 in the public eye now. That means you've made it. So, to 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 the mom of Tobias, no worries. He uh, he's a very good poker player. You have nothing to worry about. Okay. Um, Confidence-wise, I think it also helps if in the past, like you said, with handball, you were good at something. Maybe in school you were good at something. Then we can take that confidence with us to other areas. I think a very crucial thing that you said is when you decide to go all in on something, like, listen, this is, I'm going to make it. Then when adversity comes up, when we struggle, quitting is not an option. So we become uh, resourceful in finding solutions, right? You, for example, reaching out to Goose for coaching. Whereas if quitting is an option, you're like, well, apparently this is not for me and you don't push through. So I think a lot of people could make it, but they quit it too early, basically, right? Uh, I think that's a very common theme. You mentioned uh, that when you were trying out poker for this three week, you were going to ask yourself, is this satisfying for me? Well, apparently the answer was yes, because you continued. That left me wondering what makes poker so satisfying for you? Mm. I think mostly, mostly competition. Um, I mean, obviously money as well. Like, I mean, it's it's funny. You sometimes see podcasts or interviews with poker players, and like, like people tell you it's not about money. Or, it's, I mean, come on, like, like you play for money. It's like the poker is played with money. There's like you 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 can't deny it. Um, so so yeah. I mean. Obviously, like making a lot of money with like something that's fun is, is super super satisfying. But I think the uh, you, you, if you don't read like money as only money in poker, like more something like um, let's say a, a ranking or a high score, like who who makes the most money is, is the best player, which uh, is, is I mean it's not true because like obviously there's uh, some of the very good players play games where they like where they yeah make not as much money as they could if they if they would game select better or something but but you you have an indicator for who's better than the other guy like just by making more money um or having a better win rate or whatever but yeah i think the the thing that the, there's the connection between okay i can play on a certain level and i can study on a certain level and i can get better or i can not get better whatever i decide to like if i want to put in the work uh, that that makes that makes me better as a as a poker player than other guys, and it's like yeah, same as in sports, right? Like like if I'm going to practice more, if I'm like like fitter than the other guy, I'll, I'll crush him. And it's, I mean, everybody who has done sports in their life uh, or like played games on a competitive level in their life, they know it's just super satisfying to be better than others. It's like <laughs> there's there's nothing to be denied about that. It's like like beating others in in something you're good at and they are good at is super satisfying you 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 you, you uh, compete with them if you lose it's fine then the other guy has a good feeling but but if you win like it's a super good feeling and in poker you have that on a daily basis right like like you sometimes see somebody make a play where you think hmm, this might not be the best play in my opinion and at the end of the day you beat that guy and then it's like okay look I made a better decision than you, or like I make a lot of better decisions than you. Uh, I make I might make worse decisions than you, obviously. But um, the yeah, at the end of the day, you you, you realize okay, I yeah, I I, uh, I am better than this guy at, at at something that I really like, and that that's that's a really big drive. Yeah, and, and even for you, what you also mentioned is you also sort of get a competitive your your competitive drive gets triggered when you lose, right? Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, like, like, like losing is super painful, obviously. For especially if if you, yeah, if you're super competitive, and then yeah, yeah it's just driving you uh, to to be, to be better the next time, and, and yeah, keep going. Yeah, so so you either win or get very motivated. It's two sort of positive scenarios. Basically, if you sit down at the table, nothing bad can happen. I don't know. I, I'd to be honest, I'd rather win than get super motivated. <laughs> but. <laughs> It's like the silver lining of a dancing, right? If things go, I, I, I experience the same. If things go badly for a certain period, it's like, okay, now, now, now I'm done. And then I go in the lab, 
and then indeed I can I, I can strongly relate to what you say. It's very satisfying that if you then you know you come up or something's click strategy wise, you're like, oh wow, and then you execute it and then you see it works. Then you can really be proud of yourself, right? And that's that sense of control. You put a certain work in, you come up with a certain strategy, you execute it, then you see it works. That's on you, right? And that's very that satisfying aspect of poker, in my opinion. Um, yeah. It, sure. it was also funny what, what what you mentioned in terms of the money. I think in general there's a bit of a, yeah, I don't know. So society thinks it's sort of bad that you like money, right? That you like the make of money. There's a sort of bad association around it. But I completely understand. Uh, you know, we're all what is the average age, for example, that watches this podcast? I think is like 25 years old. No, I think 98 percent male. We like money, okay? There's there's nothing wrong with that. We all like to make a lot of money so we can do nice things, right? There's there's nothing wrong with that. I completely. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't want to don't want to like like have you misinterpret that. I mean, it's it's not like 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 um, only about money, but I mean, again. No, yeah, I understand what you mean, but like I said, it's nothing to be ashamed about. Yeah, exactly. Like it's 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 what it is. Like if you you poker, you play for money. Like every every other thing in life, you do for money as well, and like like everybody like. Like night likes to yeah have the freedom of like and obviously money is just buying you freedom to to do like a lot of stuff that that you can't when you when you don't have it so so yeah that's, that's you also thing. mentioned the when uh, the money was a ranking for how good a poker player was but then immediately actually you corrected yourself in terms of yeah well it can also be that some guy is very good technically but he puts himself every time against Linus and loses money so he's actually a good poker player but. He didn't make money. What is your definition of a good poker player? How do you keep track of who, in your opinion, is a good poker player? So apparently it's not just end of the year who made the most money. No, for sure not. I mean, but to be fair, like everybody who's who's up there on the list that like on the on the biggest winners every year, those guys probably just had the best game selection. That's something you don't have, uh, like you, you can't forget or you don't, uh, yeah, you have to just take it into it. Like it's it's not only like being technically the best player, like playing, uh, playing your best at the table. Like if there's some guy that has like the best game selection, has access to the best games, can play sixteen hours a day for whatever reason every day, he will probably make the the most amount of money in that year, no matter how good or bad anybody else is. Like that's that's definitely a skill that has to be taken taken in there. Um, but yeah. Um, I definitely say there are, there are poker players out there that make yeah, yeah a lot of money while probably not being like in the in the list of like top twenty poker players in the world or like top fifty poker players in the world. I don't know like like where you want to draw the line. Um, but yeah, they, they they just have something else for them uh, and and that works. But but yeah, for for me personally, um, yeah, I mean just go out there, look whoever holds the lobbies, uh, whoever you play against that um that feels the toughest. I mean, uh yeah, I'm playing like like all the high stakes games every day and you, you definitely like get to play versus versus anybody out there and yeah. It's it's just it's just something you figure out during during your daily grind, like okay, who have who I'm having the most struggle against, like what that what's that guy up to, like what's that guy up to, like how 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 is he playing? And and you you figure out like for yourself like probably everybody else everybody has something else has somebody else in his mind who's the toughest opponent or who's like the best player. Um, I mean can't deny that that like guys like Linus or Stefan they they are obviously up top there. Um, but yeah, there 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 might be players that are a bit under the radar that are also really really good. There might be some guys playing like the like the high stakes games. Well, you probably find players on like mistakes that are technically better, like mm -hmm. very likely. When you mention that uh, some players are tough to play against, you mentioned Linus Stefan, obviously known as uh, very good no limit hold'em cash game players or no limit hold'em players in general. What is it about them that makes them so hard to play against? Hmm. I mean, what makes in general? Why do you struggle versus versus certain players like them? Um, the issue is, I'm not really knowing why it's so tough. Like like Stefan, for example, like he's he's just out there. Like 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 
there's a lot of stuff he's doing you you can't figure out in in solver and that's probably the way that most of us study every day with like you you, you play a hand you check it in in PO afterwards and he's doing a lot of stuff but yeah I mean if if I had figured it out <laughs> he wouldn't be that tough to play against it's like I don't know like the guy is is is, is a genius I, yeah, I'm a really big fan, by the way. Shout out to Stefan. Uh, really big fan of him. Um, like, I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a good point. If you had that answer, you would, you know, you wouldn't struggle with Stefan. That's actually a very good, a very good point. Uh, uh, you to go back to um, the time that Goosecore helped you, right? You were struggling to to move up to mid stakes, and you said you did a did a session with Goosecore, and there was some eye-opening stuff. Do you still remember what was so eye-opening about it? Could you give an example for maybe yeah. Yeah, that other lower stakes players? Let's open up their eyes. Mm. How to get to mid stakes? Uh, to be honest, no idea. Like this is this is too um, this is like too long ago. But but I actually have something in mind from yeah the what I mentioned before. Like I had a, the exact same thing when I was playing Super 500. I was like, yeah, like decent winner I'd say and then like going to be close to break evenish and there there I actually had this this moment uh not not, not with Busco but with Uri and um this is this is yeah uh something where you um I think where you, when you started with solvers every day it's like really easy to look at solver and just see like okay solvers doing this or solvers doing that okay I'm just doing that but there was like a certain point where I, where I started to realize like why why is Solver doing this why is Solver doing that and this was like like something that 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 Uri taught me or like like yeah he opened my eyes like okay maybe maybe think a bit more in depth and I think this is a really 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 big point that is that a lot of a lot of people and not only like like low mid stakes players even like high stakes players they they like. Yeah, they just look at solver, try to copy it, and not have a deeper understanding for it. And I think if you, if if you want to get like one advice for for people, like let's say to jump from NL hundred to NL five hundred, is like don't spend too much time like just trying to copy G GTO or like GTO. Um, uh, like look at solver and like like look at reactions, look what solver does, look what the reaction is, and then figure out like hmm what's the reason for that like is there something this is this is like yeah for what reason is this happening there, there's always you always find an answer if you look really in depth right like there's always some action and some reaction and this this is like a really really big thing or was a really big thing for me back in the day and i i, I get it these days when when i coach like other high stakes guys or mid stakes guys it's stuff a lot of people don't know and this is really surprising for me uh, and that was like a really really yeah really big big I hope not at that point. No, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I understand what you mean. I remember when I started to coach students as well. Some were way more into solvers than me, but I just had certain concepts from the solver, and I wasn't necessarily following the solver exactly in every spot. Right. Also, to follow the solver exactly in every spot is useless because yes. the the ranges, for example, will never be exactly the same. The bar texture will never be exactly the same. If you look at a solver, I think you should just look, you should use it for your study time and look for concepts in terms of, hey, on these type of boards, uh, these certain sizings, for example, are being used. Oh, interesting. We choose this type of hand selection. Why is that, right? These are, and then make or learn, understand broader concepts and then try to implement that into your game. But your game should not be a copy of the solver, right? You should just use it as inspiration. Yeah, I, th I think concepts is a really big keyword here. This this is what what you said. Like like rather like look out for repeating patterns. Look out for concepts. Like like realize like when it's something is going to happen, when something is not going to happen. Um, that's yeah, that's the thing you look out for, and not like okay, I have like this certain combo. Do I really want to bet like thirty eight percent of the time now or not? I mean, like come on. It's like, yeah, you want to focus on what applies like 80% of the time, just apply it. And then in it, then if in game, you know, you spot a nice exception, great, tap on your shoulders, you know, execute it. But 
if you start to really want to execute all the exceptions, you're kind of going to miss the, the, the most important things too often, in my opinion. You mentioned that uh, indeed uh, you started working with Yuri over at the Gorilla, probably in their uh, uh, in their CFP program back in the time. Um, when you also mentioned that you were then teaming up with probably other students and coachings, how did your week to week look like when you were trying to then go from five hundred Zoom move up to high stakes? What what are some of the guy, things that you guys were doing? Um. Yeah, so we basically had like a really, really strict schedule. Like we had, I think, two or three group sessions a week um, where we just like, yeah, focused on really basic theory stuff, like how to barrel a certain spot, how to call down a certain spot, and then like just go spot by spot. And the good thing at that point is like the group sessions are like, three or four people like we're just like a really small group and everybody's basically on the same level so so that helped a lot like this this obviously changed over the years right like nowadays when i sometimes check the um yeah check the coaching steer it's group is bigger it's it's a bit it's um yeah a bit more students um and then you you still have that but well there was something like super special i think we were just like three four guys everybody on the same level not not like in bigger groups where some people play like in a 200, others play like in a 1K and you have a different player pool. We were, like you said before, with your four students sitting at the same table, we were all sitting in the same games. We had like the yeah, similar reads on opponents. We had like the population reads. Uh, and then we just went from like, yeah, doing like three groups, group sessions a week uh, to a certain topic. Uh, yeah. And the rest of the time, yeah, just, just going and play, grind in volume, like, like check, check hands to that certain topic. Like sit back two days get like two days later sit back um, and talk about that topic again. Like realize, okay, look, I had that spot in game and it worked out this way for me. The other guy had a spot and like ah, it didn't work out for me. Whatever we we talked about before, uh, and then yeah, just take it from there and then like 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 really like doing the theory session, grinding, focusing on that. Like afterwards talking about that, going to the next uh, spot. And yeah, mostly like jumping from spot to spot like that, and and really a lot of grinding in um, in the meantime. Like I've always been been uh, more of a grinder than like a guy that puts in like six hours theory a day. Like like I'm more the guy that puts in like two hours theory a week, and, and rather like like sits down and plays and um, like yeah, realizing realizing the stuff while playing. I mean, there's a uh, there's a very big difference in the quality of volume that you put in. I assume that then when you play, you're really on the lookout for okay, how can I apply how can I apply all these concepts that I'm learning, right? You you used the poker tables to get better, whereas I think some players who just say, oh, I just like to play a lot of poker, they're just I don't want to say clicking buttons, but yeah, they're they're sort of clicking buttons, right? They don't have they're not playing this session with the with the bigger picture in mind. Like the bigger picture is that. This session should help me get closer to my goals, which in your case was to go from 500 Zoom up into the higher stakes. How can you do that? Well, I'm going to use this session to implement knowledge that I was given by my coaches or that we came up with our study group, and we're going to try to implement that. And then a very important thing that you mentioned is then to afterwards get our hands, right, of spots that you got in and get feedback. And basically, you had a good system in place, which was sort of a loop, right? You have new knowledge, you execute, you evaluate, new knowledge, execute, evaluate, spot by spot, and then before you know it, you know, if you have that, if you have that in place, I mean, it's just a matter of time before you make progress. And like you said, you also had no problem in putting in the volume. Uh, in our last podcast, actually, we had Patson, who was a big advocate of promoting volume. He said, yeah, in the end, you have to play volume. That's that's it's the only way you can convert your technical knowledge into money. Uh, some players then have trouble playing a lot of volume. Usually it's mental game related. Uh, for Adam Hughes, with a lot of players who come to him who want to play more volume, but due to maybe mental game issues that didn't work. Did did you ever experience any troubles, mental game related, that caused you to not be able to play volume? Or would you say that your ability to execute what you knew technically was always quite high? Mm. It, I think it was actually quite high. 
Um, but uh, to be to be fair, I'm not not the best uh, when it comes to mental game. Like I'm often struggling with like um, with like losing, um, uh, and especially when it's like a longer longer um, period of time when when you're on a downswing. Uh, I think fair enough. I have to say, like, like after I, I, um, yeah, went from like five hundred to like high stakes, I really didn't have like a, something like a really big downswing ever, like, like, like not something huge at least, uh, and that 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 helped me. <laughs> that helped me quite a lot. Like, I would I wouldn't have known. Like, let's say I move up to like two K NL and immediately lose like thirty forty stacks. I don't know how I could have handled it there. Um, on the other hand, I was always kind of careful when when moving up, like like um, uh, especially like an example two K and that I just had. I was really struggling with that, and I was like never at a point where I think like, okay, I'll go there, lose ten stacks, and be like mentally so so frustrated after that that I can't put in the volume on one K or five hundred anymore. It's like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think when it comes to that, like if you have your your certain yeah, like your your daily limit where you play like ninety percent of your volume, I think as a professional poker player, you just get used to that. Like you, when you lose, it should be some limit that that you don't care about. No, that, no, that sounds bad. Uh, that that it's not not hurting you anyways to lose or win a lot. Um, it's like. Um, yeah, and I think that if if that's the case, like yeah, you you're just fine. Or I'm personally, I was always fine by by yeah, by having big losing days or uh, losing weeks, um, and and then just keep going from that. And and again, I just like playing. Uh, I really like playing, so I'm uh, <laughs> I, I can put in the volume. Interesting stuff. I'm sure uh, I'm sure Adam would like to dig deeper in that. But before that, I want to ask you one more question. Um, were there maybe could you maybe give an example of something that you changed technically into your game that helped you move from 500 nail zoom up into higher stakes? You mentioned already, right? You learned bigger concepts of a solver. Is there something that stood out to you? Like, okay, I definitely changed that in my game. I was doing that wrong. And that helped me transition and get to higher stakes. Mm-hmm. If you're looking for a certain example, I'd say uh, hand choices for barreling or calling down. Like, like it's again, it's it's something. It's it's just a concept, but but there's yeah. Like if you compare like old school poker where where everybody was like playing in a certain way, uh, and nowadays like how barreling ranges, for example, in 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 three bet pots or single bet pots look like. There's a really big difference, and I'm sure, I'm sure, um, yeah, everybody that that compares like the, these things, like let's say high stakes poker from 2006 to like uh, online poker nowadays, like there's definitely different hands that get barreled, that get called down, and that yeah make make a lot of sense if you think about that, um, if if you get a bigger picture. But I think that was like one of the of the key the key things that. Um, yeah, I didn't realize before. I was mostly looking at ha- at my certain hand and thinking, yeah, okay, let's go or let's uh, not go. And yeah, that there's definitely definitely the, the there's something to it that's a bit a bit counterintuitive, I'd say. Um, yeah, I've actually we talked about this. I think it was with Jared Man as well, right? He gave I think the same example where in the past uh, semi bluffing, he called it. You know, we had equity, and equity means barreling. And nowadays we understand way more blockers, anti-blockers effects, stuff like that, and the impact that has um, on the barreling ranges. We understand that, okay, yeah, if you have equity, obviously barreling is more attractive, but that also means that checking back, for example, has more EV than if you have complete trash, right? We understand now more that we have to uh, compare the EVs in certain lines. Uh, In general, we just got way more advanced in the past. I remember as well, I was just like, uh, oh, okay, yeah, this guy... uh, or in general, this is good, good, good card to barrel, and I wasn't really thinking about, yeah, but this hand, no, it was just like, listen, this is this is a good card to barrel, or this guy likes to fold, so it was just like, okay, I barrel, right? There was no further, further thinking. Uh, I'm sure that uh, sounds familiar. For sure. This podcast is brought to you by Poker Ambition, where me and Adam have created our coaching program, The Mechanics of 
poker. After having reached high stakes poker ourselves, we tested out this philosophy on our CFP students, which saw them rise through the ranks and double their win rate. We then took the best knowledge of that CFP program and turned it into the mechanics of poker so you can have that high quality content without the long-term commitment and often hefty price that comes with a CFP program. Now I will be teaching you the technical side of how poker really works, how to think about the game and how to consistently get better. And Adam focuses on the mindset and performance skills you need to know in order to convert all that technical poker knowledge into more consistent profits at the table. Now this program is high level. It's made for professional poker players who have the ambition to break free from mid stakes and move up to high stakes poker. So if you're ambitious about your poker goals, go over to pokerambition.com for more information. And there you can also find a free one hour demo of everything that is inside the program. If you have any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. But without further ado, let's get back to more goodness in this episode. Adam, you, uh, I kind of stole a question uh, that's more your street, right? With uh, the downswing and how that impacted his volume. My apologies. Anything that you would like to, uh, to add to that? You're forgiven for diving in there. No problem. <laughs> and yeah, I want to dive into the, uh, the period from you going professional and making a lot of big jumps. All right. So I've got this picture of you working with Yuri. You're doing a lot of strategy work. You guys are really like putting a lot of time in the lab, studying and really going deep. And I think you said in the questionnaire that you did for us before the interview that it took roughly three years to go from 200 to 5k NL. And I think that's a big, that's a fast transa transa uh, transition. And most players get stuck somewhere along the way. They get stuck at 500 pool, they get stuck at 1Ks. And it seems like you didn't get stuck, but I could be wrong. So was there any period during those jumps that you did get stuck, either strategy or mindset? Because I always feel like there's two things going on. One, you've got to upgrade your strategy to beat the games, but also you need to overcome your belief systems and limitations. And very often some players either stop looking up or they have a limiting belief system around getting higher. Was there any obstacles or anything, any of the levels in particular that were hard for you to crack for any reason, or you ran into any obstacles trying to make any of those jumps? Yeah, so I think in the first place, my expectation for poker was always to be like on, on, on like, like play on a super high level and, and like, like get to as high stakes as possible. Like, um, so, so I, it was like when I when I started the the um, the coaching with Yuri, uh, yeah. At that point when like I got that big eye opener, I felt okay. Like now, like there's no way I'm not like going to I don't know like 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 high stakes. Like before, I was I was like feeling good that I made it to Zoom 500, and like I think uh, Rini knows as well. Like back in the day, Zoom 500 was that game like everybody was like ooh soon 500 like that's the toughest game in the world like 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 um and i was like uh really happy i made it there i was like ooh soon 500 that, that that's cool but nowadays if i look back like i wouldn't have imagined to make it like this high uh but after that um yeah that like switch I, there was like no doubt like i really had basically no doubt and i i was shorting 2k and l or I entered the coaching for profits, I think, back in the day. And it was going really bad, what I mentioned before. But um, after that, yeah, I think I think when I, after, after I had to like do, 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 I think I was there for yeah, a year. And it's just skyrocketed. I don't know, like, like, like really just skyrocketed. Like when I had like, yeah, close to no win rate on Zoom 500. Um, and then after that, just, just really skyrocketed and like, Cap win rates all over the stakes, like like up till 10k now. Um, and I don't know, like it was mm, the only thing that that really I really had to struggle with was like when I came to a new limit, I was always instantly thinking everybody is like a super genius. Like like right, you play 1k now, then you move up to 2k. Like you think, okay, the guys, it's that double the money. Like the guys have to be double as good. And this is this is something that is sometimes or was like for me sometimes mentally challenging when 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 you had like your your concept in your game and you know it's working 
you move up and you think, okay, now I have to change something. The guys are really, really good. Like I have to be better now. And that was like actually backfiring a lot. Like, like whenever I moved up, I thought like you have to do something special. You have to like be even better. And actually it was the other way around. Like, like uh, first time moving up was always going bad because I was like, like either spewing around, like, Calling down everybody in every spot because I thought like oh yeah it's it's, it's high stakes now they, they they have to be like the best players in the world uh, they um they just come up with bluffs everywhere whatever whatever reason you want to take for 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 like making stupid plays uh, and then like second then I was like mostly going back down reviewing it and then second time just moving up and just keep playing what you did before and and what worked before and suddenly it was like there was no difference it was like the if if you play like one k and then two k or like play two k then five k play five k then ten k there was like no difference like like it's it's the, it's basically the same games and uh you you're often facing the same opponents anyway like let's say especially from like five k to twenty k or something it's like the same player pool uh like but from the from stakes down there um like till five k like mostly challenging for me was like really to play keep playing solid. Like just just keep going with your own game and not worry about everybody else. And that was like that was the the only part where I really struggled with like um, when, when moving up. It's interesting that from the outside we often see like everyone's like better than us. Or if you look at the level above, you have to make a lot of assumptions. Like you said, I think you said you thought they were super geniuses. And then you going into those games, rather than just going there with the best you could play, you would try and do something different. And I like the lesson that you had to learn was be solid, play my usual game. Don't change strategy because I'm playing a new level. So yeah, I think that's a, a good lesson as people are moving up stakes. I'm sure a lot of people watching this podcast right now will be either shooting a new stake or eyeing up the stake above. And some of you guys might be in that super genius mode that you're idolizing those above. And the advice there is to uh, get involved, just play your game, play solid, adapt to the pool over time. And yeah, don't do things, something different because there's there's no need in the short term. So yeah, I thought it was very interesting when you talked about the influence Yuri had on you. So that's Yuri Peleg. So it sounds like you were a confident guy overall. And I think you said throughout this podcast, like when you set your mind to something and you really set your mind fully on it, you have a level of certainty that you're going to be successful at it. Now, it sounds like there was something about this relationship with Yuri that really like just opened up a box. And I, I'm interested in what that was. So uh, you said as soon as you started working with him or having conversation with him, you had no doubt. There was like, from maybe a little bit of doubt to, to no doubt. So what was it about Yuri in particular that had such a big influence on you at that time? Um... I think the the thing with Uri is like he's he was he is and always was like a, a guy that thinks outside of the box like like he's has a very very good understanding for for the game and for like the basics but like he always is always looking at the bigger picture and like not like like it's basically like you you have like you have your solver and this is like the border and you think like okay I can think here and he thinks from the basics here but he also thinks like this like like he has the, the stuff that's going outside and this is something where you're in your in your daily routine and your daily grind you're, you're often just like you're stuck here and yeah he was like really just just telling me like hey look like this might be true here but why not look at this from that perspective or from that perspective and yeah he just he just had like thoughts where i would never had yeah, I never had the idea to even even think about that myself. And uh, another thing, uh, he was like when we started working together, I, I improved really really fast. And then we were, yeah, also like like um, yeah, I want I don't want to say I'm on 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 the same level as him because that's not true. Like like he's not really playing six max these days a lot, so he might not actually right now not be on the level that I am, but if he would put in like two weeks like you he would be like 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 way better so so yeah that, that would be yeah I, I can't even say that i'm on the same level than him but but we were like getting closer from level um from level of play so so yeah we were like more like it was like it changed a bit from like not being like teacher student it was like more being like okay being able to talk on like uh head to head base and then uh yeah that that was like really good for, for me because the, he gave me a lot of confidence as well. Like you said, I, I mean, I didn't have an issue with confidence, but yeah, he was, he was, he was certain from the beginning that like when I joined, I think he told me like, 
really early that yeah, you, you, you are going to make it for sure. And um, I think he always had that mindset and that, that helped a lot, like, like having that, again, like, like in handball, like with Stefan before, like having that guy outside you, that is your coach that, that puts, puts his belief in you, that puts, um, yeah, that, that, that puts a lot of work in you and, and, and yeah, seeing that work paying off. And yeah, that, that was just like, like something like, yeah, really, really good for me. And um, yeah, having him on the side and whenever there's something uh, going on, like he, he would have to have some thought here and there. And, um, yeah. It just goes to show sometimes you just need that, that one person that one person to believe in you, that one person who sees something in you, has that confidence in you, maybe just before you've got that confidence in yourself. I know we've talked about, you did have confidence already, but somebody who goes, look, you're gonna make it. Like you, you've got the talent, you've got the ability, and that person who's got certainty in that viewpoint, and he backs it up with a lot of obviously intelligence. It sounds like Yuri's one of those outside the box thinkers that you don't come across very often. When you do, you're like, all right, this guy's head of the game, I need to attach myself to him. But yeah, I really like that he was able to instill so much confidence and bring out positive attributes in you so quickly. So yeah, it really goes to show that sometimes if you haven't got that in your environment right now, look for it. Look for somebody who can instill that bit of confidence in you, maybe a step before you get it. And it sounds like Stefan had a similar role and then you as well. So maybe a little bit of luck there, but I'm, I always feel like these kind of, almost like serendipities happen where you get these kind of talented people and talented players on the rise and they'll just end up crossing paths with the right coach or the right mentor or the right influence at the right time. And me and Rene having a lot of these conversations, we're seeing a kind of a trend line where they'll just meet the right person at the right time. I think it's one of those almost like opportunity meets that kind of preparation and the right people connect at the right times often. So uh, yeah, it sounds like that's been true, true for you. And yes, yeah, it seems like that kind of progression and having that kind of confidence in yourself allowed you just to keep going and keep going. And I find like for some players, like it sounds like maybe the 2KNL or the 1KNL level, Maybe been a little bit of a challenge, but it sounds like there hasn't really been a, a mental limit for you. I can picture at the start of the conversation, you talked about like the real goal was to beat the casino games. And at some point your mind was like, wait a second, maybe this isn't the limit. So as you were working with Yuri and progressing, say from the 200 all the way to 5K and else like the 25X jump in buy-ins, was there any point where you uh, started to think, wait, this is getting serious money? Or did you always just keep going next competition, next challenge? Was there any sort of hesitation or self-doubt when the stakes got it started getting higher? Um, yeah, before I answer that question, like, I want to add one more thing, like what you said before, like, it's, like having that right person helping you, uh, really, really big deal. But I think, um, it's like, not like, 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 even if you guys like a genius, like you, um, like having that guy in your life doesn't like change you, uh, as like a poker player. Yeah. Like you're not going to be great. Like, like two months later, like it's still, you have to still put in the work obviously so so that might have been come a bit wrong where well i've been answering the question before but yeah it's like obviously you still have to put in the work but it's um it's it's it's, uh, it's a combination of both um yeah so for that question um definitely had that when moving up uh that that i figured like okay like well now swings are big like like um I, like when when yeah, let's say like you play one can LA uh, and L, like losing 10k days close to impossible, I say, uh, and like really, really tough. But, um, yeah, having having like the, the five figure swings daily, like when you play 2k, it's, it's just normal, and then going higher, um, yeah, it's it's just like whenever whenever you it's new for you i think that's that's really tough like for me it was always that like when i moved up like it's it's double the money and i i always had like a bit of that thing where the highest limit i played is the one i performed the worst on which is probably connected to to the thing i mentioned before where, where you think like you have to be have to do like something something weird there um but yeah just just had it like recently when when the Sure, you guys realized that when the Imagine King games were running, like November, December, uh, yeah, when you start to lose like like 100k a day and more, uh, that's really painful. That's really really painful. And and uh, and yeah, uh, especially when when it's not like your daily limit, right? Like you play like 5k, play 10k, and then suddenly you lose like like uh, yeah, 20 times that uh, what you could lose normally in a day. Um, really really painful but on the other hand i kind of like the um like the thrill you get from it like I, i've never been like like the um yeah the, 
biggest nip when it came to, to moving up or like taking shots. I mean, I, I watched a bit of the Stefan podcast and he said like he was like always super, super conservative with money and, and stakes. I mean, I'm, I'd still say I'm conservative, but yeah, I, I like when it hurts in both directions, like losing and winning. <laughs> Um, so break even is break even sessions are the worst. Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. I was <laughs> that Uri always, always told me that as well. Like, uh, I'm, I'm the guy that either wins 10 stacks or loses 10 stacks. It's like, it's not like you end up break even on a day. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you like the highs and the lows, the roller coaster ride of emotions, both good and bad. And yeah, I think what it was, it was good what you're saying about basically, uh, it always kind of hurt him when you're playing your new highest stake and almost having to build a bit of tolerance for that level. I think that's a very, very common kind of theme I see with poker players. There's almost no thought exercise you can do. There's not, there's only so much preparation you can do. When you play your new highest level, your shot taking higher stake, and you're going to downswing there, you're probably going to have your biggest ever losing day. And that's normal. And you need to be able to suck that up and deal with it and just realize this is repetitions. At some point, this will be normal. This will feel fine but right now it doesn't because this is a new experience and like if there's no kind of cheating that experience you just need to go through it and i like from your personality type it sounds like it's always triggered something good in you so when you have a big losing day you always it triggers your competitive drive it's almost like the the pain of losing makes you want it want it more maybe it's that competitive nature of you getting triggered through these losing sessions whereas other people kind of don't have that i know some players crumble when they have this feeling and they have a lot of self-doubt did you ever have self-doubt during any swings of yours when you were also feeling like the kind of competitive drive getting triggered? But did that ever turn into a self-doubt period where you had to reflect on what was happening? Yes, for sure, for sure. I mean, it's it's not like it's it's not like I I, I go like to the highest stake, lose four stacks there, and think like, okay, great, like tomorrow I go and study like eight hours and and crush those guys. Obviously, like obviously you're frust frustrated after that. It's like I think it would be really bad if it wasn't that way. Like, I mean, it still, it still shows that you care a lot about it. And it's like you said, it's super painful and there's no way around that experience. I think every one of us had that experience. That experience is probably here to come for every one of us again and again and again. Um, but here, yeah, the, the thing is like, Maybe not in the moment where it is, maybe not a day after, but like like two or three days after that, you put it in a rational perspective and think, okay, like this is going to happen. This is nothing special. Like this is, I lost four or five stacks. This is totally normal on my daily limit. This is totally normal there. My win rate is probably worse in a higher game than it is on a lower game. It, it's going to happen. Like uh, you, you knew it before. Like like if, if you, if, let's say you take a shot, you, Obviously, everybody thinks or dreams about like, okay, I'm taking a shot, I'm winning five stacks, great, best feeling in the world. I mean, there's a decent chance that it goes like like this way. There's a decent chance it goes the other way, and you and you have like the worst experience in your poker career at that point. And um, yeah, yeah, I think put it in a rational perspective afterwards, uh, put in the work, and at some point come back stronger. Like, doesn't have to be tomorrow, doesn't have to be like next next ten sessions, but let it be the next half year. Like at some point you'll be back and you'll be there. Yeah. It almost comes down to uh, almost like what next? So you experience a downswing and a new stake. It hurts like hell for everyone, but then what next? Like, how do you use that fuel? Do you use that to, uh, like you said, put it into perspective and tell yourself, okay, it's only a few buy-ins. I've got this covered over the next six months. Do you use that fuel to go in the lab and work on your game and start trying to find solutions to uh, to level up? And yeah, I think it's very interesting to see the kind of what next. And for you, it might not be instant. Like I think a lot of players are going to get frustrated, a bit of self-doubt in the short term, but it's more important how you're using that over the long frame, how you're using that over days, over weeks, over months, how your attitude, your approach changes during that period. And when you're feeling those feelings, those insecurities, that self-doubt, that frustration, that annoyance that you're not achieving your goals, how do you use that? How do you use that as fuel or put it in perspective so you can get back to a steady baseline? So yeah, I think it's a really important, important lesson there. All right, I've got a question for you around uh, one, of the, one of the quiz questions we asked, which is quite a fun one. Are you someone who likes to play it safe or are you a gambler? And you, you said you're a gambler at heart and you also tick the box for YOLO mentality. So I want to ask if you've got any stories about being a risk taker, any risks that you've taken in the past that would be 
a good story to share in terms of your journey through poker or maybe even outside of poker any any times you've been a, a gambler um i mean the probably the the only real bad story i have is the one i told already where where i have spinned it up and uh and then lost it all back um it's yeah, I'm not like a, like a beach and gambler or something. Like I I don't like casino games or like everything. But but um, what I said before, like I like to thrill. Like like if if I'm doing something with friends, like and there's a bill to flip for, or there's something you know, like like I, I need it in my daily life to, <laughs> to to like to have that deal. Like I would I would love to flip with my girlfriend for dinner if we are out. <laughs> but but <laughs> so so yeah. I just need the the the, the, yeah, the the daily the daily flip. It doesn't have to be for a real amount of money. It's just like like um yeah when we are together with friends and yeah we we order pizza and we flip for it. Like it it hurts me to lose that sixty bucks if I lose the flip. It's like that's I don't know. Like I I, I just like I just like flipping. I just like uh, yeah well, whatever basically Serie B like like the, the the higher the better and that's yeah. Um, but 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 never something that is like yeah that's like really stupid and I don't think I have like in in and when it comes to real life or investments or like 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 I'm not a punter dude like I'm I'm not really spending money on on anything like it's just, I'm just like your regular everyday guy I think <laughs> and um, yeah but 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 when when I get a chance to have a zero EV flip like I'd be down to like do it for whatever was possible um, but yeah i think it's really um interesting to be able to have kind of both perspectives where you want to gamble on kind of zero ev flips but at the same time you're very calculated with what you do professionally as, as a poker player also you, you talk about your investments as well like you don't have those characteristics showing up in like kind of dangerous places that could derail you it's almost like a fun thing it's like i i like the thrills when i can but you know when to have that in the right place and i think some players who have this kind of the YOLO mentality and the I'm a gambler at heart often push like cross boundaries where they'll they'll go into their their professional life and they'll start taking risks with their bankroll, which they shouldn't be taking, which you did as well when you were younger, or they'll start taking on investments which are super high risk with like a, a big chance of failure when they're not rolled for it. So yeah, I think it's understand that's part of my personality. And where can you get those kind of thrills almost for free? The zero EV kind of uh, sixty dollars with your dinner with your girlfriend's kind of dinners where you can get that kind of thrill. So yeah, I think it's really good to uh, understand that part of your personality because if you try to cave that, let's say for you, we said, okay, just don't be a gambler. Don't take any of these kind of thrill-seeking moments. You'd probably like suppress it for a while and it'll probably come out in a more kind of uh, destructive way. So it's actually right, pretty good that you've got these kind of daily outlets where you're allowing yourself to, uh, to have that YOLO mentality. So yeah, good stuff. I mean, when, when you're a professional, right, you have that, yeah, you have that mindset anyway. Like, like if you're like, if, if if you really want to like like take big big risks at stuff you know is negative UV, maybe overthink your profession. I don't know, like like uh, like this will at some point maybe also hurt your poker game or like like uh, you hurt like you said like hurt your bankroll. Like uh, I don't know, like like you can get like you said the chill, the, the, the thrill for for free. It's like you, you get so much zero UV stuff out there, and yeah, take all of that. Um, I'm always taking that, but but no, nothing else. That's, that's it. Yeah, which I think is quite rare because like often when I kind of thrill seeking, the kind of danger is you want a bigger thrill, all right? So the, the thrill that gives you the kind of high before doesn't do it now. So it's the people who want to take on more risk. They want to gamble for more money. They want to flip for more. So uh, yeah, it's good that you can get your cheap thrills and it does, almost like doesn't cost you anything. Like I said, you've got this like professional attitude where you realize, okay, if I didn't have this mindset and I was someone who was more reckless, maybe poker isn't for me or this occupation. So yeah, I think being able to have that, but still get your thrills. I think it's a really good thing to uh, to be able to do it if that's your personality type. I'm similar. I like to uh, anything with friends, which involves a little gamble, which is a free roll or a zero EV play. I'm like, yep, I'm in, count me in for everything. And yeah, I think it's good to know that part of yourself so that you can, yeah, basically live in alignment with your values in those moments, but also be very professional in what you do and don't take on it unnecessary risks so yeah it's good to have both bases covered so Rene, have you got any follow-up questions or anything you want to steer this conversation towards yeah i'm actually not the, i'm actually not that big of a gambler myself uh i i see it more from a perspective of okay we already have a swinging professional why would i even if it's zero v why would i look up more swings and i it's exactly what i've also said like i've seen this stuff get out of control quite hard 
uh, involve like, you know, you start with just coin flips because, ah, you know, if it's a zero EV, but then it's always double or nothing. And sometimes double or nothing can fall not in your favor for 20 times in a row, you know, and people and these people, they, they don't quit. And then at some point, one person owes the other person so much money that actually both players feel bad about it. They're like, okay, what good came from this? You know? Uh, and I, I, I remember also, you know, I was standing in the club, uh, you know, there's, there's nice girls walking around and they, they're playing dice games on their phone. I'm like, guys, come on, look up. You know, there's other things going on at the moment, you know? Uh, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I've, I've, I've met people that, that, that really like it. I've met people that don't really like it. I've seen also what Adam said, people that look for bigger thrills and then indeed, you know, take that gamble mentality into other things where they lost a lot of money. So, yeah, I think it's what Adam said, right? You have to know uh, your own value system in there and then act accordingly. So I think everyone should just do if they like it and don't do if they don't like it, right? It's as simple as that. Um, looking back, what would you say throughout your poker career has been the main takeaway for you, the biggest lesson that you've learned? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, probably that there's tomorrow is another day. That's tomorrow is another day. I like that. Uh, that's something, and I'm I'm saying it on purpose because it's something I'm struggling with a lot still. Like like um, it's, it's I don't know like like what we talked about before. Like when you have a good or bad day, like like I really want to keep going, and I'm like like someone that that pushed through a lot and that also pushes through when it's not max EV anymore. Um, and yeah, I know a lot of guys that, that just like they play and they, they say, okay, whatever, it's not today. I'll just like shut, the, shut the computer down and that's it. I go outside and it's something I'm struggling with a lot. And like, I'm way better at it these days. I have been struggling with it a lot. Like, let's say I have like a big losing day. I would be the guy that would love to just play like 14 more hours to get unstuck. And this is something I, I really had to learn. And I think it's, yeah, yes, there's always a game. There's always, there's, there's always a chance to play this, this, yeah, always a better spot to wait for probably if, if you're like, um, if you don't feel like it anymore. Um, and yeah, from, from all the stuff that's, that's happening to every poker player, like, like, May it be the, the very good days, may it be the very bad days. Like, it's okay at some point, let it be. And the, tomorrow is another day, and, and we start over again. Would you say that maybe this is like the dark side of your competitive nature? For sure, for sure, yes, yes, 100%. So, yes, you know, it, it, brought, it brings you good things, but unfortunately, there's also. There's also other sides. So yeah, the, the letting go and like what you said, okay, yeah, online games, they're going to be there tomorrow again. So you don't have to win it back today. Remember also some wisdom from Jared, man. That money is gone, he said. It's no longer yours. Let it go. It's gone. Winning back is not a thing. It, it wasn't yours. I think, I think it was Elliot Rowe once said that always stuck with me. He said, no, before the end of the month, you're just, you're just holding on to the money for other players. He said only after the end of the month or after a quarter, whatever works for you after the year, then you can cash in. Then you can actually call it yours. But in the meanwhile, you're just in the possession of it, <laughs> waiting to pass it on to someone else. I think that uh, that really helps. Um, yeah. Do you notice uh, um, when you do are able to let go? What kind of impact does that have on the quality of your life, but also in the quality of your sessions the next day or the days after? Mm, yeah, actually has a very big impact, I think. Um, first first reaction when when I kind of force myself to it is always I feel bad because of like 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 it tells me like ah I should have been better, I should have pushed through. But then like if you just have like a few minutes after you wrapped up and like yeah get get back to the what we said before the normal life and, and like think about stuff that is not poker and think about your friends, your girlfriend, or whatever, whatever you're going to do this evening. Um, it has a very, very big impact. And I think it, it's definitely helping uh, for quality of that time. Like 
you just leave the thought behind. You you think, okay, that's it for today. Now I'll, I'll set my mind on something else. Um, and then you can fully focus on that and do not like have like like have, like that stuff still in the back of your head somewhere and and that you like like train you back in or something. Yeah, I imagine also it improves a lot the quality of your relationship. I can definitely relate to that as well. Then I would spend with my time with my wife after that, and she said, "Yeah, you were here, but you were not here." Does uh, that sound familiar? I have that as well. Yeah. <laughs> all, all all the girlfriends of poker players, wives of poker players, this thing now like. Oh yeah, I know that. You're presently here physically, but you know your mind is still thinking about poker. And they have done that, yeah, I think. <laughs> then, uh, then, 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 do you talk about it with her? Does she then say, "Okay, just let it out," even though I don't understand? Yeah, you know, and I, I called for bet this guy, and then she's like, "I have no clue what you're saying, but just let it out, Tobias. Come on." Uh, yeah, not, not really. Like, I'm, it's, it's mostly like we're limiting uh, the, the, the conversation to okay, today was like a good day, it was a bad day, like, and not even like talking about like how much you win you lose it's like okay I, I made a really big fuck up today or like i think i played really well today and that's that's something you can talk about right like that that's something, yeah. that's something your wife or my girlfriend is understanding like i mean if you, if you tell her hey I, I did a really good job today i, I feel like like i deserved better okay she, she can understand that if you tell her i I forward bluffed the guy and then like I got the nut board for me and he called me down with, with some catcher and I had a stupid hand. Like, what, what is she going to do with that information? Like, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's more the how does that hand make you feel that you can share with her? Like, hey, I'm disappointed in the fact that there was a good opportunity today, but I didn't show up, right? That's something that you can share. Exactly, exactly. Like, yeah, there was a good game, but uh, it, I just, I just, yeah, I had a bit of bad luck today. I played bad, whatever. This, this is something you can explain, and that is, I think it's important to share it. I'm, I'm always sharing it with, with her, um, and it also helps to understand, right? Like, especially what you said before. Like, sometimes you still have it in the back of your head, and you think about something, and you, you're, you're sitting in a bar in the evening, but you still think about it one hand or the two hands. And I think every poker player had that or has that a lot, and. Yeah, if if you tell before, like, hey, look, I made a really big mistake today, I think, and we all do big mistakes, it's, it's super normal, but but you still think about, like, I'm I'm not somebody that gets super upset about big mistakes, uh, and then then that's that's information where where other people that are not potent, like that are not in the poker world, they, they can work with that, like, okay, I know how you feel, like. I feel like you. Or I see that you don't. You're not happy with yourself today. You, you made something that you you can do better. But but this is yeah. This is something okay. Maybe maybe um, yeah. I, I get why you're not like like paying as much attention as normally or, or whatever it is. No. Yeah. I uh, I can str I can strongly relate. Then if you are able to let go and let's say you take the day off and you come back. And you then look at that session or then then you play more fresh, right? You were able to let it go. Then how does poker feel different for you compared to if you would continue grinding for 10 hours? Uh, way, way better for sure. Like, like, like have a good sleep in between, uh, seen some friends, done something that's fun. Uh, yeah, you, you, you just, for me personally, I'm totally refreshed. Like I sit down and I look at the hand and I think like, ah, uh, what? the fuck was I thinking there? I mean, uh, but then that's it. Like you see it and you have it. Okay. I mean, it was just bad. I mean, that's how it goes. But like, now I feel good. Like I'm, I'm motivated to play again. I, I feel like sitting down and, and making good decisions and, and really make sure this doesn't happen anymore. While I think while you would keep going with the session, you still have it in your, in your mind all the time. And you think like, ah, five hours ago, why did I do that? Like, I have to, like, I have to, like, make it, make it not happen now. And like, like, I have really have to force it. And yeah, I think on the next day, it's, yeah, it's gone. You, you think about, okay, I, I still know what I'm doing. I'm probably still a very good player. It's not like I made one big mistake that that's not going, going to ruin my poker career. That's, that's something everybody has. And like the best players in the world, they do a lot of mistakes and it's, 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 it's something you have to accept. Um, yeah, but what when you come back fresh, like it's something okay, you leave it behind, and what you said before, like it's gone anyway, you can't change it anymore. I mean, take it from there. 
uh, I'm, I'm not going to take credit for those words. These were the words of, uh, of Jared Mann. Um, then when you afterwards look back at the, sec at the session or at the same hand, you suddenly see things differently, right? And it's, it's interesting because why do we want to continue playing, right? Because you want to get unstuck, right? You want to win your money back. But then actually continuing playing, the action that we often take, is actually not really in line with that. It's usually better to take a step back and come back later. So it's really interesting to always ask yourself, okay, what am I trying to achieve with my behavior? Okay, that's to get unstuck. Is then continuing now the best way to do it? Probably not. And it's really interesting how we can then sometimes spot certain behavior in ourselves that's actually not helping us toward, towards what we're actually trying to accomplish. And then I think throughout you know your career, you you get to know yourself and you can make better decisions. I think also something that's very important and that I think you're very good at as well uh, is that you're in touch with your emotions, right? You recognize the fact that you're disappointed for making mistakes. You feel bad about it. Uh, we, I think in the first episode that we did from the Mechanics of Poker podcast, we talked with yours, uh, who also said that especially in poker or in society in general, especially males, we're not really allowed to show our emotions that 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 much, right? Emotions is a bit taboo uh, for us, uh, for us poker players, males. Uh, but I think it's very important that you indeed recognize that you're sad for losing, that you're indeed recognize that you're disappointed for making mistakes, because only that way we can then kind of give it a place and move on fresh. So I think, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you do that very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing what I was that before. I'm, I'm doing it well when I have a, when I have time in between. I'm, I'm, I'm for sure not handling it well while in the moment. Um, I'm, I'm definitely someone that, that that shows emotion and that that's getting frustrated. But it's a bit um, yeah, it's, 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 it's how to say that. Like I I like to show it and like to have it like like get it outside of me. And get rid of me, but it's not like affecting like let's say the level of my play or something. Like like when I'm frustrated or angry about a mistake I made, it's not like I'm I'm punting two more stacks after that. It's like I'm still kind of playing normal, but I, I have to I have to just just get it out of myself. And then then yeah, or I'm, I'll definitely like like show some anger outside or like 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 text uh, like a salty message here and there or whatever. It's like like I have to get somebody I have to get rid of it or, and talk about it. And it's like. Uh, it's what you said like it's often that that when you have like negative emotions or emotion in general mostly you're going to do it or deal with that yourself like like uh, and not really show it and especially let's say you're in a live poker setting i mean you're not allowed to smash the table after making a mistake i mean you, you can but what is like it just is so so but yeah you have to deal with it inside but like i mean you're sitting at home in front of your computer i mean obviously just let it out it's it's fine like i mean smash your mouse or i don't know whatever but then it's have to make like like make sure it's 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 yeah um it's not affecting you your as as like as your thinking process keeps going on uh it's just like yeah get rid of it and that's it and yeah i think i think in that that regard i'm handling it kind of well Favorite ways to uh, let out your anger? You already mentioned the mouse smashing. Do we get some German swearing? Uh, no, no, I'm actually not a big swearer. Um, yeah, again, like, like I sometimes like to type a salty message, either maybe in Discord, maybe at a table, but I have to be really tilted to do it at a table. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think, think otherwise it's, it's mostly the mouse. Um, <laughs> Poor mouse. Do you have a lot of mouses as backup? Uh, actually, I think I destroyed one in my career. I'm mostly just uh -huh. like, wait, I have it here. Like I'm mostly like just throwing it up there and and like something like this. This is this is just like that's in quite gentle. Throw it up and then okay. Sometimes it lands on the desk. Sometimes I'm catching it. But <laughs> if you uh, if you uh, if you look at how you evolved as a as a poker player, what is something that even up until today can really annoy you, frustrate you that you know, you know, you you you've already been a poker player for so long. It shouldn't upset you anymore, but it still does. Uh, that's a very good question, and I instantly have an answer for that in my mind. Uh, I I really, really, really hate it when I lose against players that are worse than me. Um, like, um, not even like in a single pot, but 
maybe in a part where I made like a mistake or where I think I could have gotten out or I could have like made a different um, decision or yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm playing a guy heads up and like he keeps cootering me for like 5k hands straight and I still feel like I, I have a match over him. Um, yeah, that's that's something. It's so absurd to, to even have that feeling because like when you look at the long-term graphs or something, you you see or I see I'm doing way better than these guys and it's it's totally fine. It's it's normal that 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 I have days where I lose, they have days where they win. Uh, in the bigger picture, it's 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 totally fine. But yeah, when when I have that like happening happening to me, it's it's super irrational and I, I really yeah I don't know like this is something I'm struggling with. Like when when I see a guy like especially yeah, there's some guys out there I won't mention names, but mm-hmm. yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of some of the guys that that play the daily five k. Um, <laughs> And yeah, the that that's really tough to handle for me. If if, if I lose a lot to them, that it's super stupid, but I, I just can't stop it. <laughs> I it I, I mean, again, I can I can relate, obviously, right? Because you feel entitled to win against them, and then especially if they do something stupid, it's like, oh, are you, how can how can you play this hand this way and then still win? Seriously, uh, but you I also mentioned that you get extra upset. When let's say for example someone is let's say for example someone is bad in uh, he is overly passive and doesn't bluff enough and you still called him down because you're like come on here you need to find your bluff and then he didn't obviously he didn't find his bluffs those are the most frustrating things for you so basically he's bad you got upper you got handed an opportunity to exploit that fact but you didn't those are the worst uh, those for sure are the worst. Um... To be fair, um, when I say like there are some guys that are bad or not very good, that that's me. Relative. Talking, yeah, exactly. That's me talking from a from a level of like like what I expect to be in a five k or ten k rex. That that's what I think. Mm-hmm. Like obviously, I don't want to don't want to uh, yeah say anybody anything bad about anybody or want to hurt anybody's feelings. So so yeah, they, those guys are probably overall still decent poker players. But but yeah, um, so so there. Don't get me wrong, you guys. Um, I mean, yeah. when, when, when they're at the table with Dot, you know, you, you have to have a certain standard to be able to sit down with Dot at the table, right? It's fair. It's fair to... Well, actually, actually, I think you, you, should, you should, like, like, like the worse, the better. The worse. <laughs> uh, Adam, uh, I see you as a, you know, as a mindset performance coach. You're like this stoic Zen guy. Any, any tilt issues in your poker career? Lots of them. To be honest, I've got a few lives I've lived. And when I was younger in particular, I was a bit like all over the place. I'd have highs and lows similar to Tobias where, yeah, I basically just react very visceral to my environment. And generally, yeah, I was a very fun person to be around with my friends and I had all the highs and partying a lot. Then I also felt a lot of the lows, often like anxiety or frustrations that would boil over. When I first started playing poker, I was like, I'm not cut out for this. I'm My emotions are all over the place. I'm high, I'm low. And I was living with two guys who were very zen, very stoic, very rational. And I was like, are you guys not struggling with like this situation and this one? And they were just ahead of me in terms of mindset at that time. But yeah, for me, like poker was my training ground. It was my crash course in learning on a daily basis how to process emotions, how to deal with them, what things were triggering me and where it was coming from, what deep insecurities that was actually um, showing about myself. And very often there's a lot of just wanting to prove myself with what I was doing and emotions were coming up because I didn't feel like I was doing a good job at that. So uh, yeah, in terms of me being someone like who's Zen, definitely not where I started. Hopefully I'm a lot more Zen than I used to be. Uh, but yeah, for me, it's all been a learning curve and yeah, my poker career. And I'd say the most important practice for me has been meditation. So I went deep into meditation about five years ago. I did one year where I did an hour of meditation each morning for a full 12 months and that really changed my relationship to my emotions and my ability to see them in real time and create a bit of space between your thoughts and emotions so you almost feel like you still see them happening you still get triggered you still have emotions as you go through your life but you're just a little bit removed from them and you can see them with a little bit of objectivity that allows you not to get sucked into them you can almost see your partner or something happens at the poker tables and you want to react to it but you see that if you did react it's going to lead to this consequence Mm, i'm going to choose not to i see it all the time in my personal relationship where things can trigger me and I see myself wanting to say something back 
but I've got enough awareness now to, to stop that process. But I think for everyone, it's a work in process. I'm not sure many people are um, zen from birth. And I think you've got, you've got to do the work. You've got to really explore what things are causing insecurities in you. Poker is one of those amazing life crash courses where there's no avoiding it. Emotions are going to come up left, right, and center. And if you don't find a way to uh, handle them, to regulate your emotions, to find coping strategies and adaptive strategies, poker will destroy you in some way or you'll have a breakdown or you'll be a very bad person to be around in your relationships. See, I think it's one of those things either you figure out how to manage your emotions, regulate your emotions, I would call it, or you're going to be in for a hell of a ride. So yeah, I think it's a, poker is a good crash course in that. And I think there's certain kind of behaviors you, you can do. So for, for you, Tobias, has there been any, uh, if it feels like you've been a very professional guy and you've always approached poker, especially when you went professional uh, a number of years ago, is there any kind of habits or routines that you've had throughout your career that have been very important for you? Mm, not really, I think. I think I'm mostly, I'm mostly the guy that just sits down and starts to play. Like, mm. I know a lot of guys like 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 they they really love to, to meditate what you just mentioned or they like have their certain warm up routines while uh, before starting to play they they have like yeah they sit down like get themselves into the right mindset. Mm. I've never never like felt attracted to anything of this. I don't know like like I just love the game like I love it a lot and I still love it these days and. I, I love to play whenever I can, whenever I find the time. Uh, so yeah, I'm mostly just really like when I have time or when it's my schedule. Like obviously at the beginning, they, they, I was playing when I had a time and now I can play my day uh, just, just according to poker. So that, that obviously helps to not needing something like a routine because like every day is the same working day than, than like for, for everybody else. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, sit down and play and I'll, I'll, I'll sit down, re review a hand or two from the day before and, and then just start, uh, I, just, I just like it. I mean, if there's anything that's a routine, um, yeah, you've seen me drinking coffee before, like like I'm a super coffee addict, so so I'll get a cup of coffee before I start playing, but that's that's it. Like, I don't know if you can call that a routine. <laughs> it's a routine for sure, yeah. How many coffees do you have per day if you said you're a coffee addict? Um, yeah, probably five, but it's like it's like these bottles here, uh, cups here, are decently big. So so yeah, I don't know. Um, it's it's quite a bit. But I'm I'm actually I'm actually uh, trying to to like reduce it a bit. And um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's, it's 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 a fight. Yeah, yeah. Caffeine is one of those very interesting. Let's call it stimulant effects where almost anyone who has a, co a coffee will have increased adrenaline, increased cortisol and a level of alertness. So before your grind, having a coffee will trigger you into a more alert state. But then coffee's got this kind of almost like diminished returns effect where when you have the second coffee, the third, the fourth, the fifth, you get less of an effect as, as the day goes on generally. And then your tolerance builds up. So you end up needing five coffees to get to that kind of baseline two or three coffees. So I think for most players who have a lot of coffee, it's not bad. It's just one of those things where you identify how many, how your relationship with coffee and caffeine is. And ideally from what I've seen in the research, you want to do occasional weeks off. So like an occasional, like pick a time, obviously if it's a holiday or it's a non-work period, or you don't need to be as cognitively sharp where you would allow your tolerance to reset. And apparently within about seven days, of having no coffee, that can really reset your baseline so that when you reintroduce coffee, you'll be more sensitive to it. It'll have a better cognitive effect, better impact on performance and all those variables. But yeah, it's a challenge. And I used to have three coffees a day for how many years? Let's call it four years. I had three, two to three coffees a day for four years. And then I decided to uh, get some blood work done at a health clinic. And they said, Adam, your stomach is very acidic. First thing you need to give up is coffee for a while. And I went, great. Thanks for ruining my life. And they, they suggested that it was seven weeks of no coffee. And I was like, great, the, my, I've done seven hours before, does that count? So they decided <laughs> that I had to go on this crash course of no caffeine. And yeah, I mean, the first day was like, the first week, sorry, was really interesting where I was so hyped up to uh, try and survive my days without coffee. I actually did a decent job and I, it wasn't as hard as I thought. But then around day eight to 15, that kind of second week, I was like, God, my mind doesn't work. And I had this, all these withdrawal symptoms, which is very common. You get headaches. You, um, yeah, just, just a lot of mental fatigue very kicks in very quickly. But then you come to the side and you start to feel 
this kind of baseline normal again. And I, I remember just like, as it went on, I was like, ah, oh, I don't actually need coffee as much as I thought. And then the six weeks uh, were over, the seven weeks, whatever it was. And then I remember I had my first coffee and it was literally like taking MDMA. I remember sipping it going, this should not be legal. How can we, because uh, like, I, so, I was so sensitive to it. And yeah, I remember just being like, wow, caffeine is a very interesting drug in society that we just allow ourselves to have as much as we want. But if you re reset your tolerance, it's, it's really like it's strong. It has a real big impact. So uh, since then, so that was about, I think it was a year ago, maybe 18 months. I have one coffee a day now, occasionally two, but I'm more mindful. And then once one day of the week, I have no caffeine just to keep my tolerance more neutral. Uh, but yeah, I think it's just good to be aware of how you're interacting with most things. I think what we've talked about throughout this conversation is self-awareness and how do things impact you? If you're having a coffee every two, three hours and you feel great and you're sleeping well and you're performing great, awesome. You don't need to change anything. You just keep doing what you're doing. If you realize, wait a second, I feel a bit groggy. The third one doesn't do much. I feel my sleep's all over the place. Okay, let's assess the relationship with caffeine in that context. So yeah, I think it's always understanding how things are impacting you and what you're trying to get out of it. But yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting drug, obviously, stimulant that we're allowed to have as a society. But yeah, five a day is a, is a solid amount. <laughs> yeah yeah again like I, i'm 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 working on it but i mean what you said before it's like tough right like mm. i have days where where I like really like don't have any but it's mostly uh what you said before like when going on vacation or like days where you really don't don't have to work or you you, you, um, you don't do anything that you really have to be in there because like at, at some point like the, with the withdrawal symptoms start to kick in and i mean if you're in the middle of a six hour session probably not the best point to, to have that happening. Yeah. 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 I think it's good to uh, pick your times to remove the caffeine. Cause it's one of those things as well. Like most people watching this podcast will be wanting to perform at a high level and caffeine does allow you to do that. And when you remove that, your performance is probably going to drop in those moments. So yeah, I think it's picking the right times to give your body a reset and yeah, be sensible with that to, uh, to make sure your performance doesn't drop. Cause I, I was doing the opposite. I was, trying just sporadic days, like using willpower to not have a coffee occasionally over those four years. And I always regretted it. I was like, oh, I was a waste of a day. I was unproductive. I had headaches. And I was like, don't go without caffeine. So uh, yeah, I definitely picked the, the right times to, to remove it. So for yourself, let's transition into the present day. What are some of the current goals you're setting yourself for the year ahead? And what is it that at this current moment still fires you up to uh, play poker? Well, why do you want to jump on your computer and start grinding? What is it right now that's exciting for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, further plans for next years really don't know. Like, like I was, I was said to everybody I know, like I'm playing poker as long as as I enjoy it. Like, um, it's it's um, yeah, it's just something I I, I love to do, and I I still love to do it. And yeah, I don't know, like like the 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 fact of yeah, poker having that many many different different um yeah facilities that that you need and that like 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 the game tree is so big in every spot and like there's always something new coming up the the, the meta of the game is changing uh from year to year like there's new opponents like like there's always something like like no hand is like the hand before basically that that's something that i really like about it and uh that that keeps me going because like Every hand you play, you learn something. Basically, it's it's like uh, you you know the basic concept, you know all the spots. Like, but then again, like whenever I I, I, I like put some hands in the solvers from a session, like I make like five mistakes a day, and like like how can I make five mistakes a day? Like I I, I played millions of hands. It's it's weird, but it's it's like just it's just normal. Like everybody has that, and it's like that's yeah. I don't know if it's. Uh, a bit dangerous as well because like the if if you seek for like perfection you will never reach it in poker and you basically can never stop if that's the goal but but I think that's not really the goal for me the goal is to still yeah perform on a high level like I really what I said before I really like to outperform other people um it's it's something that gives me satisfaction and gives me a lot of satisfaction um yeah and from from yeah, just the journey that I had, that I, that I did like last last two years were probably my breakout years. I think like before I was like playing like up to two k, and like last two years was like mainly only playing five k and higher, and like having yeah decent decent results, I'd say, and and that that just keeps me going. Like like 
pushing further there and like like outperforming some other people and yeah just just make it make it to the top i mean it's it's not realistic that that I outperform Linus or anybody up there but i mean maybe to top making it to the like top 10 is like would be like a super great achievement um but but yeah um that that just keeps me going yeah awesome yeah one of our goals with this podcast is to uh tell like a hero's story of how someone's went from kind of the low stakes or just trying to figure stuff out to playing the high stakes high stakes in the game and then also like what is their pursuit that they're going for so with the hero's journey there's a great book by joseph campbell on this concept he always talks about an external pursuit and an internal pursuit so the external for you is like beat the games it's solve the strategy game it's get to that next level potentially on the top 10 players there's all these external things and at the same time we're also trying to uh, internally get somewhere we're trying to grow as a person so for you right now where are some of the parts of your character or where do you feel like poker is contributing to you uh, maybe like not so much financially not so much external things is there any sort of internal yeah, avenues that you're progressing with as you're playing the high stakes poker right now um yeah for sure and i think that's a similar similar uh yeah similar point than before like uh, it just gives me satisfaction from from winning and like last year Mm, yeah last year probably like i had some uh, also had some good results in live poker and then when you go somewhere and people actually start to to realize um like um yeah realize who you are and like like people coming coming up front to you like that gives me a lot like like you guys asking me here on the podcast it's like i mean i'm professional for like four and a half years now and it's like like first podcast i'm doing and i was like I was kind of nervous and it's like weird because like obviously I know what I'm talking about. Like, I mean, it's something I'm working with every day. It's like, it's, it's nothing special. Um, but then, yeah, this, this is like, really, this, this, this gives me a lot, a uh, lot to, to go for or like to, to keep chasing after, like, like, don't get me wrong. Like not, not wanting to be famous or something. It's like stupid, like, like best case, best thing that can happen to you in poker is nobody knows you and you just like play poker and that, and that's it. But also like like if you like I remember like Vegas two years ago I was like playing the main event and um yeah I was sitting the entire day at a table with like only Americans and like end of the day some American guy comes to me and says like ah hey you you do the right and I'm like okay, so like how the, how the fuck do you know like 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 I've never been anywhere like nobody knows me uh, but but it was really surprising but also like 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 yeah just cool to see like okay like like uh the, the hard work you put in there the results you you deliver like like pe people honor that and that's uh, that's something yeah that it gives me way way more that than money does or that yeah anything else does just like okay like you worked hard you you made it made it to the top and this is something cool and i think yeah if if, if people tell you hey uh hats off this is really cool what you did like that's it's just a good feeling. I mean, you, you, you can't deny that. Like, like probably everybody that again, that did sports at some point knows that like after your game, you played great. So some viewer comes to you and tells you, Hey, good game. That's, that's a cool feeling. Yeah. I think when competition and that competitive drive is a core part of your value system and your personality, then to get respected of your peers and people who are in your industry for all the hard work, like you said, there's very very often you're just alone doing those long studying the long grinding sessions you're going through your kind of own experience obviously you share that experience with people in your circle but it's a quite a solo pursuit at times and then from the outside to occasionally get validated or respected or people say some nice things about the work you put in and how good your game is it's, it's, it's a really nice feeling yeah like i said it's very similar to sport where you lift the trophy or you win the game and you get yeah, that exactly. reward for the effort it's the effort to reward i think there's something in that i don't know exactly what it is but when you like put so much of yourself into a pursuit and you win, you get validated, you 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 get the effort is rewarded in some way. There's something meaningful about that. I don't know what it is. I, I, I'm kind of a, not addicted to that feeling, but there's something that I, I seek that often in my life where where can I apply a lot of effort? And if I get the reward, I'm going to feel good about myself. And it's more, I feel good for the effort I put in. I'm sure it's, I think it's the same for you as well. You, you feel good about it, not because it was easy, not because you were skilled at it, not because you were super talented, though, Sometimes it's nice to be people and stuff anyway, but it's the fact I had to work hard for this. I had to struggle for this. I know how hard it got at times and I still kept pursuing it. I still put a lot of hours in and yeah, I think that's a really, really yeah, validating feeling. So one final question from me, I want to ask you uh, 
how do you find balance in your life? I feel like when you're a high stakes player and you're very competitive and your goal is to be one of the best players, it can be quite um, almost like submissive where it takes over your whole life. And I don't feel like that is true for you. So uh, yeah, I want to know how do you still get balance in your life at the moment? What are some of the things you do on a say daily, weekly basis to allow yourself to feel good about yourself outside of poker? Um, actually, it's not really true. Like it, it, it's close to taking over, uh, like like the, the me as a person. Like I mean, what you said, like you you put in all your effort every day there. Um, I'm definitely having having the balance, and um, yeah, shout out to my girlfriend. Like 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 she's she's kind of yeah um kind of organizing all the stuff we're doing and when, when we're going on vacation like we make we we're going outside here in vienna and do some stuff like, like, like she's she's definitely like like um yeah um yeah i don't know how to say that like like, like she's, she's definitely organizing all the stuff we do and this is, this is like really helpful for me because we do really cool stuff that i would probably not do on my own and that gives me like really good feeling and and uh, yeah balance for for other stuff to see like okay cool there's there's other things out there um uh, to to do and that are fun as well and yeah this is definitely a really big point and without her i would probably not luck not do this at um yeah the volume we're doing it right now and yeah second point obviously sports i mean sports is really has been really really big for me all my life like maybe doing sports myself like like the, the boys here from the from our small group right like we're going to uh play uh tennis like twice a week now um yeah we, we're going to play spike ball in the summer we're going to, to play basketball I like just do that stuff and then yeah you, you i mean again it's 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 competitive again which is which is a bit sad because you get the like the the same stimulation but um you 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 still do something else and that that's cool you get outside um get to meet other people through that like that like, like most of them are poker players obviously like there's a big term community here in vienna but but like some of these guys have friends that are not poker players and you get to meet new persons through through, through them and yeah that that's helping for sure i think it's super interesting how we approach balance and when i first asked the question your initial reaction was I'm not very balanced. I, I'm pretty all in on poker right now. But as you started to speak a bit more, we could see that your girlfriend, you do a lot of stuff with her. She books cool vacations. You play sport multiple times a week with your friends in a kind of competitive environment. And I feel like balance can look very different to different people. And like Elon Musk in his own way might have some balance in his like in a 16 hour work days. I think it's really hard from the outside to judge. It's more, am I recovering day to day? Am I feeling motivated, enthusiastic day to day? Am I enjoying the life I'm living? And what things do I need to be doing on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis to allow myself to feel good? And it sounds like you've got those attributes and maybe it feels like you're putting a lot into poker, which is, I think it's a fine thing to uh, really go obsessive over a pursuit. And yeah, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily out of balance. And yet it feels like you do have that, the core ingredients of what makes you feel good and you understand yourself well enough. If you felt like you were, let's say, uh, you were putting a lot of hours into poker, let's say you, 1.5x your hours of poker and you noticed that you potentially weren't enjoying it as much or you were potentially approaching a little bit of a, a burnout or over exerting yourself what based on the initial things you would do in that moment to kind of get yourself back in balance mm, probably again just just heading out for friends or like so like like similar to the when to the point when i'm struggling poker like kind of searching for help i think like it's let's say you were really at that point where I put in all the hours there and like it's only that it's difficult to get outside of that mindset again so so yeah I mean uh yeah very blessed here with, with all the with all the guys around me and yeah I mean if, if I text any with any of them like like we'll probably just just go out and do something cool and that was probably be my way to go like like just yeah uh get get a bit of an, of an eye opener again not not in poker not poker related in that case but but just like okay look like you don't have to put like one and a half times the hours in poker you you just can go outside and do something else i'll, I'll show you something cool like, like something like that yeah i love that and i feel like the players who often burn out or they reach that point where they're not enjoying the game as much because they're overworking very often don't have that outlet or like they haven't really got that regular outlet where if things are you're overworking yourself or you're feeling too stressed 
that they might not have a friendship group to turn to. They might not have anyone to play sports with. They might not have a, a girlfriend to come find in. And yeah, I think it's really important to uh, think for yourself when you're in your environment, like what do I need to make myself feel supported? And when I'm struggling with poker, what else can I turn to? For myself personally, like when I play poker a lot, I was always going to the gym. And the gym was my kind of, it was the opposite variables where where the poker is this very uncontrollable thing, lots of swings, whereas the gym was this very linear thing. I could just put more weight on the bar, get my session done. It was also very physical where I was moving my hands and my body. And for some reason, that was a very therapeutic thing that really balanced well with poker and I could control certain variables, which were very good for me. For you, it sounds like just releasing and playing sports as well with your friends, being competitive in that environment works really well for you. So yeah, I think for anyone watching this, uh, the, the advice would be to find your thing, an outlet outside of poker that allows you to uh, switch off, find that balance. We all go through phases where we overwork, we push it too hard. How do you rebalance after that is a really important variable. All right, Rene, have you got any parting questions that you've been saving up? Yeah, I got some uh, final questions and then we're going to let uh, Tobias uh, get to his grind. You already mentioned that you you quickly mentioned about playing live poker. And I, when I Googled you, I saw Hand Em Up, Cypress, second place, High Roller, 10K tournament. Is playing live poker going to be part of your grind in the future going forward? Um, not really. I mean, I've always done it like occasionally, let's say one or two weeks a year, maybe. Uh, like last, like last years. I mean, last two years was basically zero, obviously. Um, but, mm -hmm. um, like before, I did I did Vegas with with some of the friends. Uh, but I'm not the guy that that like goes four weeks or five weeks straight to the casino every day, sitting there, like uh, just just yeah, grinding the life game. And you sit there, you fold all the time. I mean, life. Life poker has definitely something cool about it, and it's that you you just you meet a lot of of yeah people you wouldn't have met otherwise, and it's it's kind of fun environment. It's a bit I think it's a bit more relaxed than playing online. Like everybody's hanging there in their chairs, and you order a good drink on the side. You you have uh, you have good food. Like um, that's really cool. But for the daily grind, uh, for me it's too boring. It's, it's super boring. <laughs> like like right, you play a couple tables online. Um, yeah, there's there's something happening every second. But then like you sit at a live poker table, you you sit there and not play a hand for eight hours. It's like yeah, it's it's super super frustrating. Um, but but uh, yeah, again like as as kind of a vacation, I really like it. And uh, no, I'm actually going to Cyprus again. Like somewhere in March. I'm not sure. Like the um, but. But yeah, I, I like to combine it. Then you can go to the beach there and like like chill a bit, and then yeah, play play some some poker. And yeah, so far I got super lucky with like the the result you just just mentioned. Like I I didn't even want to play that. I just like played it out of randomness on the afternoon, and then ended up becoming second. But this is not like you'll not find me in the in the uh, live poker tournament scene or somewhere. That's that's not going to happen. <laughs> So it's more like a work holiday type of uh, type of vibe that you're going for. Yes, All right, yes. Goose. Actually, I asked him, uh, "Is there anything that I should ask Tobias?" And he said one thing that was relating to live poker. He was asking if he if your quote quote crazy tattooed look is an advantage or disadvantage at the live tables. I see. I see you have quite some ink on your arms here. Uh, is it an advantage or a disadvantage playing yeah. live? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I know how he thinks about it. Uh, I'll, I'll probably give the answer what he thinks. And I think it, it's actually that way. Um, I'm more looking like a hobby player or like a fun player when I walk into the casino. And uh, he always says that like when whenever I play live and like, I think people like to bluff catch me. Or, like I'm, I'm looking kind of crazy, uh, like kind of spewy and... I mean, I'm probably not uh, not on the nitty side anyway online, but I mean, in live game, they, you sometimes have scenarios where you just know you have it, or like everybody knows you have you have it, and um, yeah, I think it might might pay off sometimes that that especially if people don't know me, and like like usually people don't know me because what I said before, like I've never been some on somewhere, or like I've never like grinded live streets, so uh, yeah, uh, maybe have to like. Cut it here so people don't see my arms in the in the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
can can stay under the radar for future life life poker games. Now you have to make future adjustments. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, I'm the, uh, I think it probably paid off a couple of times where where I get like like some some calls that I would have not gotten if like I have like this knock look. <laughs> all right, all right, and. In terms of tournaments, do you sometimes play tournaments online or strictly cash? Uh, I maybe played like the, the the 10k on GG. I played like four or five times last year, but I think that's a, just say no. Like, I mean, not really. Like, I mean, what what would yeah would be a lie to tell uh, that I play like I mean, 10, 10 tournaments a year is is not like playing tournaments, right? Like, this is this is not right. what. Yeah, so it's not it's not part of your grind. Any any ambitions to maybe in the future, you know, like uh, there's quite a lot of money also in uh, in tournaments. Mm, no, absolutely not. I mean, again, absolutely like... not. So that's that's quite clear. No tournaments <laughs> for me. What is it about? What is it about cash games compared to tournaments that you dislike? What do you dislike about tournaments? Well, I mean, the, yeah, just to think that Ryan's is super super high, and if you're um, if you're uh, yeah, you're better than others. It might not pay off instantly. And this is what I said before, like I'm struggling with that anyway, right? Like I'm struggling with it in a cash game where it's like probably the lowest variance you can get if you're better than other players. Uh, so why would I like get myself in a scenario where I have to deal with like really big variance where I'm probably like worse than the average field? Like let's say I'm jumping into a tournament now, like, like, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I would not know how I perform. Uh, let's say I sit down in the cash game table. I'd say there's probably close to zero tables online where I don't think I would be profitable. So, so why would I would I have to deal with something where I don't know what's going on and where I have to deal with the, the mindset issues again? And yeah, yeah you so, have to sort of start from zero again while you're already at the yeah, top. You, know? you have to be in the like night grind or something like like tournaments often like take super long day you end up playing like early mornings and stuff and like i like playing fixed hours i like just playing daytime having like a lot of free time with a uh, girlfriend or friends in the evenings and, and not not worry about that um yeah maybe maybe yeah, yeah. You're in there from from the beginning right now and you you look for for max ev and, and where you can make the most money long term probably something to go for but yeah for me at this point i think this is that absolutely not again like absolutely nothing that, that i want to want to uh, try out no yeah i can relate to that schedule i mean you you lose some of your freedom you have to suddenly play night times i'm not i'm not much of a night guy i'm also actually not a morning guy i just i don't know i'm just a, a regular guy I, I don't know how else to put it uh my last question for you um what do you think going forward in pursuing your goals uh you know, trying to you you mentioned you want to get into into top ten. What do you think is your greatest challenge moving forward? What would you still need to improve upon in order to reach that? Uh, again, don't think there's a certain certain topic or certain spot or whatever in poker I need to improve. I think I would again answer just playing super solid. Like, like, just keep going with what I'm doing right now. Like, like, keep having daily routines. Keep having like the your 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 daily or weekly studies. Like, uh, analyze hands. Like, especially try to learn from mistakes. Like what I said before, there's like you know the spots anyway, and and you you mostly know what's going on. Like, there's some small nuances, and obviously at a super high level, uh, these these nuances will make off quite a bit, but um yeah just get a little bit more accurate in, in the stuff that, that i'm doing and uh, other than that just just yeah just keep keep going like not not try to do like go for the crazy weird stuff go for yeah just just go for solid solid day in day out play and yeah keep going all right is there anything tobias that you would like to share before we before we call it an end um hmm. I actually don't think so. I think we recovered a lot of the stuff that that, are, that was important for me to talk about that that also I want to yeah to, to have like the, the, the viewers of the podcast that that yeah might 
might be on the on the chase for what I what I did over the last couple of years, like 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 try to get some insights. Um, yeah, hope hope could deliver some 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 cool stuff, like some struggles, some some good things. Um, yeah, it's 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 just not a smooth ride, and um, yeah, just just keep going for it. Um, that, that's that's probably all. Just believe in yourself and go all in. Yep. All right. Well, I would like to thank you very much for being on. Uh, it was a it was a pleasure to have you. Uh, yeah. I think there was a lot of wisdom in the podcast, so thank you very much for that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, guys, for having me. It was a really cool experience. Uh, really enjoyed it. Great conversation with Tobias, Adam. We already, before I press record, already talked a little bit more. We were very enthusiastic about various things that he said. What were your main takeaways from this conversation? Yeah, my main takeaway is first one was about how balanced he was in terms of his kind of life experiences prior to poker. He worked with uh, mentally disabled children for four and a half years. That's a lot of time doing things for other people, being empathetic, putting your own goals on hold and yeah, living a very rich experience by helping other people to deal with really big problems, which I'm sure set him up well to, uh, to deal with poker. And then alongside that, he had this kind of 20 year handball career where he's very competitive and he's, he's almost bringing out that competitive drive in himself whilst being in a team environment, which he seemed to really enjoy being part of a group community. And that really set him up well to go into poker and be competitive in that. So uh, I think it's always interesting to hear how life experiences, even though they might seem completely different, can set you up for the next chapter of your life. And I think listen to his story throughout, we could see that every kind of chapter of his life was setting him up well for the next chapter. And then the next thing I really liked about his story was when he talked about basically building his role from $1,000 to call it to 30,000 and then losing it all very quickly. And from there, he uh, triggered a competitive um, environment from him where he wanted to uh, go back to the casino and beat the competition. And he said, this story's not over yet. This story's not over yet. So uh, rather than treating that like a defeat, so he's built his role up, he's he's lost it all. He's treating that as like, okay, I'm going to learn, I'm going to get good at poker, I'm going to go back in that casino, and I'm going to beat those guys. I think that's really interesting how a bad scenario or a challenging scenario can trigger many different reactions. Some people be crumbled, go, right, I'm done, this is proof that it's not going to work. I thought I was good, now I'm not. He put his ego to the side completely, and yeah, just got good at poker from that moment. It was like a, a catalyst moment, which I thought was really, really interesting. And then I really liked when he talked about these little three big experiments he did, which was really interesting. So uh, basically at this stage, he was basically working with Goose Core. He was playing 200 NL and he had a job which was working with disabled children. And he was trying to figure out, can I make enough money poker like to go professionally? And he was already having a good win rate at, at his games, but he didn't want to take on a huge risk in the short term. So he would give himself three weeks where he'd lock himself in his kind of bedroom or wherever it was. And he would basically play poker for tw- 10 hours, 12 hours a day. And his goal with that was to go, do I like this? Can I imagine myself playing this full time? Is 10 hours too much? Is this enough? So in all those little three big experiments, he saw, I like this game. I want more of it. I could, I could do this professionally. And that gave him the confidence to uh, quit his job or, or end his contract, I think it was, and then go into poker full time. So I think sometimes we've got to take on these little experiments. We've got to almost simulate how the experience would look. And yes, we don't know until you try it. So yeah, there's many, many other avenues, but those were, were three of the main ones that uh, really resonated with me, which I'll take away from this, this interview. How about for yourself, Rene? What were some of the main uh, things that you'll, you'll stick with you? Yeah, if you don't try, you don't know. Eh? So often you know, people have certain certain dreams or certain things that they want. But if you don't, as long as you don't try, you never know. And that's also, he said, I need to at least have tried this because else afterwards I might regret it. So he had the confidence also, right? That's a very big, very big one because he, he gets defeated, but he has the confidence that he is going to come back and crush it, right? The story is not yet over. I love I loved that sentence. So he has that belief that he's going to make it. And afterwards, he goes all in, right? He didn't try it half-heartedly. He said, no, I'm going to make it. I'm going to do everything in my power that I can to make it. So then if adversity comes on our path, it's not what you said, like, oh, yeah, this is proof that I cannot do it. He says, like, no, this is just adversity. Okay, I'm a bit stuck here. Then what did he do? He looked for outside help. He went to Goose Corey. He went to Yuri Pelik, right? And... Every time later, I think you also asked him another question. He said, what would, you, what would you do in this scenario? He said, ah, probably look for help again, right? That's a really strong 
a, a really good character in my opinion. I, I'm exactly the same. Every time when I want to learn something, I, I reach for help. I reach for uh, uh, coaches, new information, books, podcasts, you name it. I try to get outside information to get better and to to obtain certain knowledge or a, a certain perspective to to allow me to surpass this obstacle that I'm facing at that moment. Um, it also, we, we also briefly talked about um, what were some of the things that uh, in coaching really were eye-opening for him. And that was in terms of solvers, right? That we said it time and time, time again, we shouldn't copy the solver. Really look for concepts, right? The solver is just a different world. It's just a playing environment. And he said, action, reaction. And often we take a certain action because of a certain, we induce a certain reaction from our opponent, right? If we check a strong hand, that's probably because our opponent is going to do the betting, for example. Then if our opponent doesn't do the betting, we should probably not check our strong hand, right? Action, reaction. He was looking for certain concepts like that. And then these concepts he translated into his poker game, right? And this is how it's actually played. The way the solver plays is actually not how we play in game, right? We cannot copy it. We can only learn from it. That I felt was very strong. And one thing that he really learned from it that was eye-opening for him as well was hand choice, right? The solver uh, took different hands. I think he gave barreling as an example or calling down. Then us back in the days, we were very equity driven. I think that was the that was kind of the story where solvers take more blockers and anti-blockers in consideration. And that kind of opened up his mind again in terms of how that works, right? Again, it's an example of something that the solver can teach you. And then afterwards, we can take that knowledge and apply it in our strategy. Very good stuff. To, to add on that, uh, I remember the last podcast, Pat said, but you should still stay, str- stay true to what was your strength, right? What made you a poker player? And then add these concepts from the solver to that game, right? People often look for or go for coaching and they want to be taught a new strategy or a new way of playing poker. No, you're just adding bits and bits to your game. So I thought, the, thought that was very, very strong. I would like to thank everyone again for tuning in and for showing us all the support in these podcasts. We're very motivated uh, to bring on new guests. We're always looking for new guests, inspiring guests as we're very in- excited um, for as well to talk to. And I would like to see you all back in the next episode. Thank you very much. Now, if you learned something in this episode, we would much appreciate it if you like and subscribe. Leave a comment with your main takeaways. Give us a five-star rating and follow the pod. This way we can reach more players and help them reach their big and ambitious poker goals. And if you want us to help you get to those goals, go over to pokerambition.com to find out more.